computer today. I'm uh, I'm at home doing this, and before I've always been at work. Mm-hmm. But since we were going later, then I try to figure it out, make it work at home. Okay. Okay. I see. I do see uh, live on custom. Are we? Yes, ma'am. This is Mary speaking. We are live. Okay. All right. I think someone's phone. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I now call to order the first meeting of the year of the Michigan Civil Rights Commission. Today is Monday, January 25th. The time is 5.03 p.m. And this meeting is being held utilizing the Zoom web conferencing platform, as well as live streaming through Facebook and YouTube. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chair Clayton. Present. Commissioner Combs. Present. Commissioner Gasco bentley Present. Commissioner El Hassan. Present. Commissioner Robeson. Commissioner Korabu. Present. Commissioner Kosaraju. Present. Commissioner Dallara. Present. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. We will now have the swearing in of our new commissioners. Mr. Corvo, Ms. Kosajaru, and Ms. Lara, will you please raise your right hands for the oath of office? And please repeat after me and say your name where appropriate. I. 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 Gloria Lara. Anu Kosaraju. Do you solemnly swear or affirm do you solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States? That, that, I, will that I will support the Constitution, the Constitution of, the United, of States, the United States and the Constitution of this state and the Constitution, and the Constitution of, this state, of this state, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office, and that I will faithfully, I will faithfully discharge the duties, the of, the duties of, office, of this office of Michigan Civil Rights Commissioner according to the best of my ability. Of Michigan, Michigan Civil, Civil Rights, Rights Commission Commissioner for liability. Congratulations and welcome, Commissioner Richard Corvo, Commissioner Anu Kosazaro, and Commissioner Gloria Lara. Would any of you all like to say a few words? Anyone? Okay. You did a fantastic job, Swag. I said. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Let's hope the rest of the meeting goes as well. Our next agenda item is the approval of the meeting agenda. May I have a motion to approve or amend the agenda? Motion to approve. Motion has been made by Commissioner Gasco bentley Do I have a second? Second. The motion has been seconded by Commissioner Lara. Is there any discussion? All in favor to, of the motion to approve the agenda, please say aye. Oh, I guess it's already done. Okay. Aye. Aye. All right, thank you so much. The agenda has been unanimously approved. Our next item is opening matters. Again, good evening and welcome to the first meeting of the 2021, of, of 2021 of the Michigan Civil Rights Commission. As information for our new viewers and as a refresher for returning viewers, I've asked our special advisor, Ms. Sylvia Elliott, to give a brief overview of the commission and its authority. Ms. Elliott. You're muted, Ms. Elliott. Thank you. Unlike other commissions and boards that are governed by bylaws, the Michigan Civil Rights governing documents exist in the Michigan Constitution, the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, and the rules of the Michigan Civil Rights Commission and Department. The commission is established in Article 5 of the Michigan Constitution. And in there, it tells you that the the commission is to investigate allegations of discrimination, secure equal protections of the laws without discrimination, and that the legislature shall provide an appropriation for the effective operation of the commission. This is the only state to have the Constitution embed, I'm Yes, the uh, uh, department and the commission embedded in the constitution. The second governing document is the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, one of the two civil rights laws in the state of Michigan. 
and Article 6 in particular, Section 601, outlines the powers and duties generally of the commission, quorum, and other matters. Article 7, specifically Article 705, tells us that the commission is not prevented from securing civil rights guaranteed by law other than those spelled out in Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act. And that basically means the commission's powers are very broad and any right deemed to be a civil right falls within the jurisdiction of the commission. For example, there's nothing in the Elliot Larson civil rights that speaks to election laws or voting, but because voting rights are considered a civil rights, the commission has jurisdiction over voting rights. The final document are the commission rules and department rules. Therein, it spells out the jurisdiction of the commission and that it's not limited to only the processing of complaints, but the commission has quasi -ju judicial authority to enforce the civil rights laws, to hold hearings, to order opinions and decisions, to award attorney fees for damages, interests, and damages to the harmed claimant and to adopt interpretive or procedural guidelines to govern the work of the commission. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Elliott. Mm -hmm. Next, we're going to have the recognition of significant days in the month of January from Commissioner Combs. Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, I was wondering if I could be heard. Um, as we're looking at our agenda, there is the recognition of the National Day of Racial Healing in Michigan, the National Day of the birthday of the Honorable Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and also the recognition of Fred T. Korsmatsu Day in Michigan. I would imagine that uh, the chair wants me to have some remarks about this and the remarks are, I think that it is a extraordinary thing for the Civil Rights Commission to recognize all of these particular holidays for the contributions that these individuals have made to civil society and to the betterment of the whole of our communities. We salute them. Thank you, Commissioner Combs. Next, we will have our public comment protocol from Deputy Director Mary Engelman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I will read from the nouns. Viewpoint. This is what happens when you're at home or you're not at home. Uh, here we go. Um, today's meeting will be recorded. All speakers must identify themselves by name first before speaking. If you are required, if you are requiring closed captioning and you are using Zoom, you can turn on captions by clicking on the CC icon on the lower left part of your screen. The commission has already received written public comments and will only be accepting verbal public comments during the meeting. If attendees wish to speak during the public comment portion of the agenda, you must sign up to do so within the next 10 minutes by typing your name and city you reside in in the chat box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If unable to type in the chat box, please click on the icon labeled participants to raise and lower your hand at, at the lower center of the screen. When it is time for public comment, Staff will call on attendees in the order in which we receive the request to speak, whether via chat or raised hand. MDCR staff will first verbally identify public comment speakers by name, and then that individual will, un will be unmuted to speak and will be muted after their designated time frame for speaking um, before speaking ends. The public comment time frame for speaking will be two minutes. There will be a visual timer on screen showing the following colors, green for two minutes, yellow for 30 seconds, and red for stop. The timekeeper will verbally remind each speaker when 30 seconds remain. For attendees who are calling in by phone to provide public comment, callers must enter. Um, this is different than in um, the past, so it is pound two on their mobile device. So remember it is pound two if you are on your phone um, to raise and lower your hands. MDCR staff will identify callers who wish to speak by the last four digits of their phone number. Please also be aware that MDCR staff will verbally warn any speakers only once if they use inappropriate, inflammatory, or disrespectful language. If use of the language continues, the speaker will be muted. 
For those who are joining us live via the MDCR Facebook page or the MDCR YouTube accounts, there will be an approximately 20 second delay between the actual Zoom meeting. Individuals who wish to deliver verbal public comments can only do so if they are attending via Zoom or by phone. And that concludes my um, spiel. Madam and Chair. thank you. And just so that everyone heard, it is now pound two instead of star nine for people who are on the phone. Is that correct? It is now pound two to raise your hand? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next agenda item is the acknowledgement of former commissioners Laura Ray's Kopeck. Jeffrey Sakwa and Denise Grimm for their leadership, excellence, and commission in defense of civil rights of the people of Michigan and the prevention of discrimination. Are the three commissioners with us? I do see Commissioner Race Kopak. Are the other two with us? Here's Commissioner Grimm. Is Commissioner Sakwa joining us also? Commissioner Kopak, good to see you. I thought I understood that he would not be present today. I thought. Chair Clayton, this is Sean Sanford. Um, Commissioner Sakwa is on the line. He's actually on the phone. His last four digits are 3004. Can we have um, the last four digits of 3004 from the attendees list um, promoted to panelists, please? Thank you, Ms. Sanford. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Okay. Good afternoon. You so won't have we... to hear me for very much longer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. So uh, we just wanted to take this time on our agenda to thank our three former commissioners whose terms ended on December 31st of 2020 for their service. I am going to start with uh, Commissioner Grimm who served on the commission from 2018 to 2020. She actually retired and that is why she is ending her term early. So Commissioner Grimm, we just wanna thank you for your service as a commissioner for the past two years, especially wanna thank you for um, what you did at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, how you made sure that the Asian community uh, was supported, that people understood some of the discrimination that was going on when our pandemic first hit and all of the good work that you've done. So are there any words that you would like to say? No, um, it's been an honor uh, serving among such a prestigious commission. I've learned a lot and I will take it with me and, <laughs> and uh, please feel free to contact me anytime. And also I just wanted to show the wonderful recognition award that you gave me. Um, I absolutely love it. So thank you. Thank you very much. God thank bless. you. <laughs> thank you. Were there any commissioners who wanted to say anything to Commissioner Graham? Oh, yes, I wanted to, if I may. Yes, sir. Yeah, I wanted to uh, thank her for her uh, exceptional and uh, civil service on the commission. She always had a very uh, caring and sensitive department in her deliberations. She always was thoughtful and she uh, seemed to be uh, introspective in her analysis of uh, those things that came before the commission. And so I would hope that she would take her skill set and gifts into the community and continue to make such contributions as she, she did to the commission. And thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Combs. Our next commissioner that we are going to recognize is Commissioner Jeffrey Sakwa, who served on the commission from 2017 to 2020. He was a commissioner and for the last year of 2020, he actually served as a secretary on the executive committee. So Commissioner Sakwa, thank you very much for your service on the commission. I don't think I'm alone in saying that I'm going to miss having you uh, on the commission. You always brought a special insight and uh, levity to the meeting, which will be missed. Would you like to say a few words? Of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's been an unbelievable honor to serve with everybody. At the same time, it's been an unbelievable challenge. I think it's a challenge that I really hope that this next um, uh, group of commissioners can pick up on. I think we did a heck of a job picking a new leader, executive director, and I'm really excited about him taking place. It took us a very, very long time 
more than we wanted. But I think we're in good hands. As I wake up every day and look at the television and read the newspapers, this this Civil Rights Commission is a really big deal. And I hope that people take advantage of us if they're having issues and problems. And quite frankly, I can't, I, I'm shocked at the world we live in right now. And so I, from the bottom of my heart, I thank all of you. Continue to do great work. It's really, really needed. And um, God bless each and every one of you. And I feel like I made some new friends. And, you know, we, we really got along well. And I'm proud of that. And I hope it can continue. And I'm going to wear it like a proud badge every single day that I got to be a part of something so great. Thank you. Thank you. Any commissioners who have comments for Commissioner Sackwa? Okay. Commissioner Collins? Uh, yes. Uh, as, as it relates to uh, our distinguished, gifted, and brilliant, intelligent Commissioner Sackwa, who's now leaving us for the public and the private. <laughs> Um, I thought that he was uh, extremely transparent and very honest uh, and uh, very real in, in his communications and contributions to the commission. Um, you never had to wonder where, what he thought or where he was coming from. He was very direct about what his thoughts were, his feelings, and his disposition on all issues that came before the commission. And for that transparency, I want to thank him. Uh, we think that, or oh, I think that he made a very uh, reasonable and valuable contribution to the commission and we're going to miss his, uh, shall we say, roughness around the edges. <laughs> that, that is a nice way of putting it. Thank you, Commissioner Combs. And I <laughs> saved the longest for last and that is Commissioner Laura Ray's Copet. I'm going to just cover the part of her time that she served on the commission in the last um, years from 2015 to 2020 but then I'm also going to ask her to tell everyone that this is actually her second go round on the commission because uh, in 2015, she served as commissioner, 2016 commissioner, 2017, she was co-chair, 2018 co-chair, 2019 secretary and 2020 vice chair. So I don't know if there's anyone else who has served on executive committee and leadership roles that often with the Michigan Civil Rights Commission, but I just want to say personally, the uh, first time I was on the executive committee as vice chair, and you were there, Commissioner Kopak relied on you. And then when I was chair in 2020, and you were my vice chair, I relied on you very heavily uh, to make sure I was kind of doing things in the right way as it relates to the commission. And just wanted to thank you very much for all of your service and dedication. And are there any words that you would like to say? You know, it's been an honor and a privilege to work with each and every one of you. And I, I enjoy, really enjoyed the discourse and the civility that this uh, commission um, displayed and, and, and very rough issues sometimes. And sometimes uh, things that we don't always agree on, but we always came, I believe, to the correct des uh, decision. And, you know, one of the, the toughest parts, and I think, uh, Commissioner Clayton and Chair Clayton uh, was going through the process of getting a new executive director. And that took a long time, but I guess I echo um, Jeff's sentiments as well, that I think that even though it lasted longer than we had anticipated, that we made the correct choice. And that um, with, um, with uh, Mr. White's leadership, this commission and department will go a long way. And, and I just will also want to say that I enjoyed working with each and every one of you. And I worked very closely with Stacy throughout the, the last couple of years. And I have enjoyed every minute of it. You've always been such a hardworking um, chair. And as I mentioned to you, I mean, people don't know how much work it goes in time it goes into it until you're there. And then you realize that you just can't sit back and let things go along um, un, unchecked or you know rechecked. And Commissioner Clayton, you've done a ph phenomenal role as chair. And, I, and I'm really glad I had the opportunity not only to work with you, but um, become a friend of yours. And, you know, and all the rest of the commissioners, you know, um, Denise and Bishop Combs, and also, um, you know, Commissioner Ellison, and, and some of the new ones that I, I know indirectly, 
And but I wish you all the best of luck. And I know that you were going to move the needle forward in the future uh, in the area of, uh, of a civil rights. And I thank you for um, working with me. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Kopak, will you talk about, because I don't have it here, I didn't mention it, but when did you first serve on the commission? I, I can't remember the exact, it was in the 1990s um, and uh, Governor Ingler appointed me at that time. And I, at that time, I also served as uh, co-chair with Judge Lombard and, uh, and he was also a, you know, a great commissioner as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any commissioners would like to say any words to Commissioner Kopak? Commissioner Elsan? Maybe I should let Commissioner Combs go first because I'm going to rely on the adjectives that he uses to describe <laughs> one. <laughs> I, did, I didn't see your hand, Commissioner Combs. Okay, go on. Right. But go ahead, Commissioner Combs. Well, you're very kind and <laughs> thank you uh, for your um, thoughtfulness uh, as you always demonstrate on this commission and since our meeting. I found uh, as it relates to uh, Commissioner Kopeck that she was a, a quiet, uh, very cautious consensus builder. Uh, she was not looking for any controversy and or to be in anything that was controversial. So she worked behind the scenes extraordinarily well. And uh, it was fascinating to see her and the previous chair work together, um, as well as the, the current chair. And so it's obvious that uh, her skill set as a Juris Doctorate served her and the commission well. And we thank you for your brilliant contributions to the commission. Thank you. Commissioner El Hassan. So I just wanted to share a few collective thoughts on all uh, three of uh, my uh, colleagues and now friends on the commission. Um, thank you for your service, certainly. And uh, I, I told you I was going to rely on Commissioner Combs' <laughs> descriptive uh, adjectives for each of each one of you, which are directly on point uh, and certainly uh, appropriate. Uh, I just found all three of you to be very intentional in your thought, uh, great strategic partners. While I've only had the pleasure of serving with you for a year, it's been a wonderful experience. I've learned from each and every one of you, and I hope to continue not only the friendship, but certainly the dialogue. I know that you're all passionate about um, things that happen that come before the commission. That passion is not going to stop simply because you're not serving on the commission. So uh, I know that we'll continue the conversation, and I look forward to those times. Thank you. And Commissioner Kopeck, do you have your gift there with you also? No, to show? no, I have not received it yet. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Okay. I still in the mail. <laughs> okay. Oh, my Christmas gifts. <laughs> okay. Um, and I do believe, believe that as a former co-chair, you received a special gavel um, as your gift. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. The next um, item on our agenda is the resolution for Judge Dalton Roberson Sr. And I just wanna say that uh, unfortunately, the end of last year, we lost two of our former commission members, uh, Commissioner Dalton Roberson Sr. and Wayne County um, Sheriff Benny Napoleon and Judge Roberson Sr. So we have special tribute resolutions that we have prepared for both of them that will become part of the official record of the commission in the state of Michigan. I, we, um, Commissioner Roberson is not here with us, but um, I know that she will appreciate this resolution for her father and it reads, resolution honoring the life of Judge Dalton Roberson Sr. Whereas the Michigan Civil Rights Commission joins the family, friends and colleagues of the Honorable Judge Dalton Roberson Sr in honoring his committed life to justice and public service. Judge Roberson was born on May 11, 1937 and died on May, November 10, 2020 at the age of 83. While the dates designate his birth and death, his story is truly told by the noble life he lived between these dates. And whereas, although there was no high school near where they lived in rural Alabama, Judge Roberson's family recognized the power of education so much that his father paid a local farmer $2 a week to provide a daily ride in the back of his truck to the nearest school. And whereas after graduating from Mobile Training School in Mobile, Alabama, Judge Roberson moved to Detroit in 1953. Judge Roberson served his country as a boom operator in the United States Air Force. After being honorably discharged, Judge Roberson attended Michigan State University where he earned a bachelor's degree and was active in the Delta Pi chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi. 
Whereas Judge Roberson then worked for the City of Detroit's Department of Civil Services before deciding to enroll in what was then the Detroit College of Law. Upon obtaining his Juris Doctor from the Detroit College of Law in 1967, Judge Roberson worked as a Wayne County Assistant Prosecutor, Assistant U.S. Attorney, and in private practice. Judge Roberson was appointed to the Michigan Civil Rights Commission in 1972, where he served until Governor William Milliken appointed him to the Detroit Recorder's Court in 1974. And whereas Judge Roberson was elected as Chief Judge of the Recorder's Court in 1987, the National Conference of Black Lawyers named Judge Roberson Judge of the Year in 1992. Detroit Recorder's Court merged with Wayne County Circuit Court in 1997, where Judge Roberson continued to serve as a judge until retiring in 1999. After a brief retirement of playing golf in Diamond Head, Mississippi, Judge Roberson returned to Detroit in 2013 and frequently presided in Wayne County Circuit Court as a visiting judge until his passing. And whereas Judge Roberson is remembered for the sage counsel and advice he provided to assist both young prosecutors and defense attorneys who appeared before him. Judge Roberson was committed to making the legal profession more diverse. He often cited as an American, he's often cited as an inspiration, role model and mentor by a great many African-American attorneys. And whereas Judge Roberson was respected as a champion of justice who treated those who appeared before him having been accused of a crime with the same respect and humanity as he did their attorneys. Judge Roberson leaves a lasting legacy of striving for both equity and excellence in all aspects of the practice of law. And therefore be it resolved that the Michigan Civil Rights Commission commemorates Judge Dalton Roberson Sr.'s life and his contributions to the city of Detroit, the state of Michigan and beyond. We join his family, friends and colleagues in remembering him as a torchbearer who loved the law. And be it further resolved that on this 25th day of January, 2021, the commission recognizes and honors Judge Dalton Roberson Sr.'s legacy of service and commitment to the American system of justice. And may we please have a brief moment of silence for Commissioner Combs. I'm sorry, for um, Judge Dalton Roberson Sr. Oh, thank you. Oh, and we have been Judge. I'm sorry, Judge. We have been joined by Commissioner Roberson. And I apologize for my tardiness. I had another call that ran over, so I apologize again. Okay, well, thank you. Well, um, when we had our meeting in November and we paid tribute and honor to your father, you weren't able to be with us because that was so close to when um, he had passed. So we're glad you're able to be here today to hear the resolution and receive it virtually. And to know that we know he is very proud of your continuing on in his footsteps, not only in the law, but also on the uh, commission. So would you like to say a few words, Commissioner Robertson? I absolutely. Um, Madam Chair, I want to thank you and I want to thank all the fellow, all my fellow commissioners. I got so much, so many messages and love, plants, thoughts. I know I was in your prayers and your well wishes, and I appreciate all of that from all of you. Um, I am honored again to serve on the commission, to follow in my dad's footsteps and and while I miss him terribly, my family and I miss him terribly, we know that um, he had a long and very full life and, and, and that's all that we all ask for. So thank you so much for everything. I appreciate it immensely. You're welcome. Were there any commissioners who wanted to say any words? Okay. Yes, this is uh, Commissioner Richard Corville. Um, having been long in the tooth, I had uh, many opportunities uh, to appear before Judge Roberson, uh, and he uh, he was a special uh, judge, and maybe more importantly, uh, he was a special human being. Uh, he was always uh, uh, very kind and understanding with attorneys, and very uh, very considerate and compassionate. Uh, to those who appeared before him. Um, I and I know my fellow members of the bar who appeared before him uh, considered him to be a, a great judge and a Thank great you. human being. Thank you very, very much. And welcome to the new commissioners. I haven't had a chance to really meet anyone. So um, thank you so much for that. And um, I look forward to working with our new commissioners. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Next, we have a resolution in tribute to Benny Napoleon, and I do believe his daughter Tiffany Jackson is here to join us. Is Miss Jackson here, and can she be promoted to panelists, please? Hi, 
I'm here. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, Ms. Jackson. Thank you so much for being here. We can hear you and see you. The um, resolution in tribute to your father, Wayne County Sheriff Benny Napoleon, will be read by Commissioner Combs. Yes, ma'am. I will at this time begin to read this resolution in honor of our good friend and of this uh, quintessential transformational leader, the Honorable Wayne County Sheriff Benny Napoleon. Whereas the Michigan Civil Rights Commission joins the family, friends, and colleagues of Wayne County Sheriff Benny Napoleon in honoring his committed life to law enforcement and public service. His beloved daughter, Tiffany, summarized her father's essence with three words, generosity, integrity, and faithfulness. And whereas a, a lifelong Detroiter, Napoleon was born on September 10th, 1955, as one of seven children to Betty and Reverend Harry, Harry Napoleon, known in his use as, quote, Skinny Benny, unquote. Napoleon was a star basketball player at Cass Technical High School and graduated in 1973. And whereas while working as a salesman at Sibley Shoes in downtown Detroit, Napoleon was inspired to apply when he saw a Detroit police recruit van. Napoleon rose to the ranks at the Detroit Police Department and was promoted to sergeant in 1983, lieutenant in 1985, inspector in 1987, and commander in 1993. He was promoted to deputy chief in 1994 and to executive deputy chief in 1995, the only member ever to hold that title. Napoleon was appointed chief of police by the Honorable Mayor Dennis W. Archer in 1998. He retired from the Detroit Police Department in 2001 after 26 years of honorable service. Under Napoleon's leadership, Detroit's crime rate was reduced by 30%. And whereas Napoleon graduated from the FBI National Academy, the United States Secret Service Dignitary Protection School, the Northwest University School of Police Staff and Command, the Aristi Institute of Executive Development at the Warden School of the University of Pennsylvania, and Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. With these accomplishments, Napoleon ranks among Michigan's top law enforcement officials. And whereas, while working as a full-time police officer, Napoleon put himself through night school earning an associate's degree in law enforcement, cum laude, from Mercy College of Detroit in 1980, a Bachelor's of Arts in Criminal Justice, cum laude, from Mercy College in Detroit in 1982, and a Juris Doctorate degree from what was then the College of Detroit of Law in 1986. In 2004, Napoleon was named Assistant Wayne County Executive, appointed to fill a vacancy as Wayne County Sheriff in June 2009, and then won his first election in a landslide victory. He was reelected to four terms in subsequent years and earned 74% of the vote for his last term. And whereas, just before the beginning of his new term, Napoleon lost his courageous battle with COVID-19 on December 17, 2020. Upon his passing, numerous elected officials and others bestowed well-deserved platitudes upon his memory. And whereas Governor Gretchen, Whit the Honorable Governor Gretchen Whitmer cited Napoleon's quick laugh laughter, eager partnership and candid counsel while describing how Sheriff Napoleon's love for the people he served was returned many times over. Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist II remembers Napoleon as, quote, a pillar in the community, a model public servant who led by example through conscientious words and selfless service. And whereas Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan said that, quote, he cannot think of a leader in his town who has been more loved and admired than Benny Napoleon. He was born in the city, served our community courageously his entire adult life, and loved Detroit as much as anyone I've ever known, unquote. Reverend Wendell Anthony, president of the Detroit branch of the NAACP, reminded us that, quote, Benny Napoleon was not just a sheriff. He was a watchman who loved and protected this community. He was a selfless warrior for peace through justice, unquote. And where's James E. White? executive director of the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, who previously served as assistant chief of the Detroit Police Department, described Benny Napoleon as, quote, 
the kind of leader who paved the way for others to follow, unquote, calling Napoleon a personal mentor who always was about his people, his people on the force and his people in the community. And whereas current Michigan Civil Rights Commission Chair Stacy Clayton, who also had the personal privilege of working with Benny Napoleon in the Archer administration, called him, quote, a favorite son of Detroit who dedicated his adult life to unwavering service to its people, unquote, explaining that Benny Napoleon's public service went beyond law enforcement. His legacy of fairness and civility continues with the community to this day. And therefore, be it resolved that the Michigan Civil Rights Commission commemorates Sheriff Benny Napoleon and recognizes him as a champion of the community, a devoted public servant, a role model, mentor, family man, and friend. We join Benny Napoleon's loving daughter, grandson, mother, siblings, other relatives, colleagues, and constituents in honoring the legacy of a well life or well lived life. And be it further resolved that on this 25th day of January 2021, the commission recognizes the honors and honors Sheriff Benny Napoleon's legacy of service and commitment to the American justice system and the cause of civil rights. That concludes the reading, Madam Chair, of the tribute to the honorable and the legendary transformational and indelible Sheriff Benny Napoleon. And thank you, Commissioner Combs. And, and Tiffany, I'm sure you'll appreciate this. There's so much that your dad accomplished during his lifetime that the reason he's being honored today was not included in the resolution. There was um, uh, several versions of it. And the final version, because we want to make sure we included everything in there, I don't believe actually made reference to his serving on the Michigan Civil Rights Commission, unless I missed that in the reading of it. But I know in one of the early versions it was. He also was a three-time chairperson of the Civil Rights Commission when he was appointed. So we will make sure that when we do the final version that we also include that language in there because that paragraph somehow got omitted. And thank you, Ms. Elliott, for pointing that out while it was being read. Okay. Would you like to say a few words? Yes, I would. I just want to thank you, Madam Chair, as well as all of the other commissioners and anyone else who may have been involved in you know, his honoring this evening. I want to Thank you all for recognizing his lifelong dedication and commitment to public service. I think that your resolution truly encompassed who he was as an individual um, and who he was as a professional. And I'm just so grateful, I said this once before, that he lived a life worthy of such recognitions um, that even his legacy is just still changing and impacting lives and that his reputation has followed him even unto death. So I'm just very, very grateful that you all allowed me an opportunity to be with you all this evening to be a part of this virtual um, honoring of my father. And um, I just thank you all for the continued support and prayers and well wishes um, throughout such a difficult time. So thank you so much. You are more than welcome. Are there any commissioners who would like to say any words? Okay. Uh, Commissioner El Hassan, well, Commissioner um, El Hassan and then Commissioner Combs. Hi, Tiffany, I'll be really quick. Thank you, um, thank you Commissioner Combs for those um, beautiful words. Uh, certainly uh, all uh, very true. I would just add that um, Benny was for the people. As simple as that, he was for the people. I had the pleasure of working with him. Um, for seven years when I uh, served uh, the county. Um, and not a single time did he not come in with such humbleness and conviction and passion to do good. Um, just one of a kind. Uh, there will never, and I can say this unequivocally, there will never be another Benny Napoleon. Thank you, Commissioner El Hassan. Commissioner Combs. Yes, I'd simply like to echo the words of uh, Juris Dr. Allison, um, that Benny Napoleon was a personal friend, um, a comrade in law enforcement. And when he served on the Civil Rights Commission many years ago as its chair, I remember that I was, um, <laughs> I was uh, representing the Anti Coalition for Fair Banking Practices at that time. And we had some uh, casework that came before the commission. This is where I met him. And he was uh, extremely kind, uh, warm, ingratiating, and uh, he was able to chaperone what we were asking the commission to do through the commission and get the support we needed 
across the state with regard to the Michigan Civil Rights Commission and uh, moving financial institutions to be a little more uh, conciliatory in their lending practices. So his reach as far as the public service was at least across the state of Michigan. And then when he went to work for Isaiah McKinnon, um, when uh, a number of friends were working under um, Chief McKinnon's auspices, uh, he again was a very good friend. You could get access to him. He made himself available. He was a problem solver. He worked um, with whoever or friends and or whatever issue he was dealing with to try to get to the bottom of the matter and to bring about justice in every situation that he participated. So um, he will be missed and uh, yeah, he's almost irreplaceable. It's probably the end of an era, the loss of Benny Napoleon. Thank, Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Combs. And it was 1984 to 1991 that he served on the Michigan Civil Rights Commission. And he, uh, as I said, uh, three terms as chair. Uh, Director White, did you want to say anything regarding uh, Sheriff Napoleon? I'll just say that, uh, thank you, Chair. I'll just say that uh, I echo much of what has been said here uh, this evening. Uh, Benny was, was simply authentic. Um, he, he led with such distinction. He, he made young police officers want to, to be chief. I mean, he made you want to rise through the ranks. Um, you know, he, he really truly, and, and it, it's, it's been stated so much, but he really was about the people, you know, take care of your people and, and they will take care of you. That's, that's what he told me. That's what he told us uh, as young supervisors. I had the absolute honor of getting my first supervisory badge from him. He appointed me to Sergeant. Um, and he, and when he talked to our group, it was always about taking care of your people. Uh, and, and, and certainly, um, you know, that's the legacy that he leaves. And when I, you know, when I think about some of the work I've got to do here uh, as it relates to um, attempting to build this morale and, and support these folks that are doing this incredible work, uh, it will be Benny's message to me that I use as a foundation of that work. So uh, I just wish his family the best. His brother, Hilton, you, uh, Ms. Jackson, you are an amazing young woman. And I'm sure that he's uh, very proud of you. So God bless the family. Thank you so much, Director. I truly appreciate those kind words. It's funny, I'm, as I'm sitting here thinking, there are a few people that um, like Beyonce, LeBron, that can be known as by one name. Yes. Benny is one of those people. You say Benny, it doesn't matter who you are talking to. They <laughs> know exactly who you are talking about. So yes, he's in very, very good company. Yeah. Um, we want to just go on and have a moment of silence in tribute to uh, Wayne County Sheriff Benny Napoleon, former Michigan Civil Rights Commission. So we can just have a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us this evening and being here to receive the um, resolution on behalf of your father virtually. So thank you. Absolutely. So thank you. I appreciate the invite. Thank you. Okay. All right. Our- Madam, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Just a reminder for a motion to adopt the resolutions. Oh, thank you. so. Thank you, Mr. Levy. Thank you so much. May I have a motion to adopt both resolutions? So uh, moved. Okay. Moved by Commissioner Combs. You have a second, please. Okay. Second by Commissioner El-Hassan. The motions uh, approved. The resolutions have been adopted. And again, thank you so much, Mr. Levy, for that um, reminder. The next item on our agenda is the election of our 2021 officers. Commissioner El Hassan, will you please announce the names put forth by the nominating committee for the positions of Commission Chair, Vice Chair, and Secretary for the year 2021? Thank you. Uh, given the, the new year and our new commissioners, uh, first, let me start off by welcoming Commissioner Corvo, Commissioner Lara, and Commissioner Kosaraju. I am uh, honored to serve alongside you and look forward to working together to do good on behalf of the state. Uh, the nominating committee, uh, which was made up of myself, uh, former Commissioner Laura Kopak, that's pretty uh, quick to call them former, but I have to be uh, accurate. And former commissioner, uh, Jeff Sackwa, 
uh, uh, convened as a nominating committee and nominated the following names to serve on the executive committee. Stacy Clayton as chairperson, uh, Zina El Hassan as vice chairperson, and Ira Combs as secretary. Uh, those are the names that we are proposing to serve in those roles. However, I'd like to open it up uh, to my fellow commissioners to see if there are any nominations from the floor. Do we have any nominations from the floor? Okay. Seeing as there are no nominations from the floor, I would ask for someone to make a motion to accept uh, those three names and corresponding positions on the executive committee. The motion. Yep. Commissioner Roberson, so moved. Okay. Support. Okay, motion has been made by Commissioner Roberson and supported by Commissioner Lara. Is there any discussion on the motion? That is a roll call vote. So, Mr. Levy, will you please call the roll? Mayor Clayton? Yes. Commissioner Combs? Yes. Commissioner Gaskell Bentley? Yes. Commissioner Ellison? Yes. Commissioner Robeson? Yes. Commissioner Corvo? Yes. Wait, no, sir. Commissioner Kosajaru? Yes. And Commissioner Lara? Yes. Madam Chair, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, this unanimous yeah. vote. Congratulations to Commissioner Al Hassan as Vice Chair, Commissioner Combs as Secretary, and I just want to say thank you very, very much to all of my um, colleagues for um, the opportunity to serve again as Chair of the Michigan Civil Rights Commission. Last year was an excellent year. We had a lot of challenges going on. We did not see COVID coming, system. which is going to uh, impact how we operated. As some of our former commissioners have mentioned, it took us two or three, I, I lost track of how long, how many rounds to actually get our director. I was very pleased to be part of that process. And I think that um, Director White was a great choice and he is doing wonderful things within the department. Now, I also wanted to say that I had the privilege of joining in the new member orientation this past Thursday with commissioners Kos Kosazaru, uh, Lara and Corvo. And it was just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful experience. And I think that all of my colleagues are going to be very pleased with the contributions yeah, they're going to make to the commission. Uh, the questions they ask in their bios don't necessarily tell the full breadth of work that they have done in the area of civil rights over the years. So it's going to be very exciting to work with them and receive their input going forward. So again, thank you colleagues for um, electing me as your chair again. I look forward to doing great things in 2021. The next item on our agenda is the adoption of the consent agenda. The following items from the consent agenda, I'm sorry, the following items from the agenda have been identified as those that may not require a commission discussion prior to being adopted or received. Items may be removed from the consent agenda on request of any commission member. Items not removed will then be moved for adoption by general consent without debate. Removed items will be taken up later on the agenda as indicated. May I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda? So move. So move. Okay, okay. Uh, moved by Commissioner Combs. May I have a second, please? Second. Okay, seconded by Commissioner Lara. Is there any discussion? Seeing, seeing no discussion, the consent agenda is approved. The next item is the approval of the minutes on the November 23rd, 2020 regular meeting. May I have a motion to approve the minutes as submitted? So moved. Moved by Commissioner Alassan. Uh, may I have a second, please? Second. It has been seconded and supported by Commissioner Corvo. Commissioner Corvo, you're here. Oh, um, let me finish this vote. Uh, is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, the minutes from the November 23rd, 2020 meeting have been approved. Commissioner Corvo, your hand is raised. Did you? Um, Want to say something? Yes, I, I apologize. I was having uh, some trouble with uh, my setup here. As I told you, I'm home. Uh, we were talking about uh, Benny Napoleon earlier, and if it's not too late, I'd like to add a, a comment. Oh, yes, sir. Please go ahead. Um, 
when I was a younger attorney, and again, that was a long time ago, I first uh, met Benny when he was a, a lieutenant with uh, the Detroit Police Department. And uh, he was, uh, if he was anything, he was always very affable, very friendly, very cooperative. And throughout his career, he remained that. Uh, I think I spoke to you individually at a different time that when I can't imagine Benny not being here, every room he was in, if you were on the other side, you could hear his laughter. It was always smiles. And some people leave this planet and they're forgotten quickly. Some elected officials, once they're out of office, they're forgotten. As there other comments made, Benny is part of the fabric and fiber of Detroit. And uh, I think he'll be remembered uh, for an awful long time. And, you know, they say things uh, come in threes. Uh, uh, we lost Judge Robeson, who was a great man. Uh, we lost uh, Benny Napoleon, who was a very special human being. And as some of you may or may not know, we we lost uh, Judge uh, Isidore Torres uh, very recently. And he fit that fabric, too. Uh, uh, they were all very important part of Detroit, and uh, and God bless their souls, and may they long be remembered. Thank you, Commissioner Corvo. The next item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes from the November 23rd, 2020 special meeting. We have a motion to approve the minutes as submitted. So moved. Motion has been made by Commissioner Combs. Is there a second, please? Second. Second. Okay, that's been seconded by Commissioner El Hassan. Is there any discussion or revisions to the minutes? Seeing, hearing, no discussion or revisions. Madam Chair, uh, I, 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 yes, no. I'm sorry, it's Director Roberson. I, I'm Commissioner Roberson. Sorry, <laughs> flipping over from my last call. I would just like to abstain since I wasn't at the November meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay. So uh, seeing no discussion, we have seven approvals and Commissioner Roberson has abstained uh, from that. Well, and Commissioner, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Levy, since our other commissioners were not there, do they need to abstain also our new commissioners? It, they do not need to, they could choose oh. to. Okay, okay, then that's fine. Okay, we'll leave it um, as is. Okay, um, those minutes have been approved and the motion carries. Next item is public comment. Our next meeting agenda is public comment. As a reminder, we will have, I'm sorry, we will be taking comments in the order we have received them. You have two minutes to speak before the commission. However, if your comment involves a matter that is currently pending with the department, such as an open complaint or an investigation, it is inappropriate to speak about that before the commission. This is done in fairness to the parties and the process should your complaint come before the commission for a decision and order. Reminder, to address the commission, Zoom participants should type their name and city they reside in the chat box located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. If you're unable to type in the chat box, please click on the icon labeled participants to raise and lower your hand at the lower center of the screen. Callers must press pound two on their mobile device to raise and lower their hands. Please note that our timekeeper is Mr. Dan Levy. Uh, Ms. Sanford, how many speakers do we have? Thank you, Chair Clayton. We have two speakers so far. Okay, we have two speakers. Yes. And who is our first speaker? Our first speaker, um, her name is Diana Marin of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Ms. Marin? Can yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, you have two minutes, please begin. Okay, thank you. My name is Diana Marin. I'm an 
supervising attorney with the Michigan Immigrant Rights Center's farm worker practice. And first, I want to thank the commission for all of its prior work on behalf of Michigan's farm worker community and its recommitment to farm worker issues. I would like to highlight several key issues currently affecting farm workers that deserve the commission's attention. The first one is investigation into the agricultural businesses August 2020 misinformation campaign regarding the Department of Health and Human Services public health order requiring free testing for certain agriculture and food workers. On August 3rd, 2020, DHHS issued an emergency public health order aimed at protecting agricultural workers and Michigan's food supply chain from COVID-19. The order required, among other things, that certain agricultural employers provide free COVID-19 testing to its workers, regardless of race or ethnicity. On August 11, 2020, a lawsuit was filed against DHHS and Governor Whitmer by the agricultural industry claiming the public health order discriminated against Latinx workers. Merck and 30 other organizations opposed this lawsuit and supported the public health order, and two federal courts ruled against agribusiness's request for a temporary restraining order against the order. The lawsuit was eventually dismissed in September 2020, and thankfully, the public health order continues in effect today, providing key protections to farm workers during the pandemic. Yet in the lawsuit, at least 100 plus Michigan agricultural businesses stated their opposition to the order, and some publicly even stated they were only testing Latino and Latina workers, a clear violation of ALCRA and the public health order itself. Moreover, disinformation campaign was conducted both in the media and within certain agricultural workplaces claiming that the public order only required testing of Latinx agricultural workers, which is not true. Merck respectfully requests that the commission ask MDCR to look into this matter and issue a clear statement that employers must comp comply with ELCRA when implementing the public health order. The order is still in place and Merck hopes it will continue to be in place this upcoming growing season. So this statement by MDCR or the commission would go a long way in sending the message that discrimination will not be tolerated during this pandemic. Uh, second, we also request oh, that the- uh, Ms. Martin, yes. um, your yes. time is up. We'll give you just uh, 30 more seconds, but you're too- I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the, the second is request that the commission support the timely distribution of COVID-19 vaccines for farm workers in Michigan. As you know, the vaccine has given us hope that we will return to normal soon, but COVID-19 is not over yet and farm workers continue to bear the brunt of the pandemic. On January 6, 2021, DHHS published an update on vaccine prioritization and Merck was alarmed to see that food and ag workers slated in the 1B phase to get the vaccine in January this month were then at the last minute moved to the 1B subcategory C group um, with a tentative vaccination availability of May 2021. We strongly believe this is too late and farm workers should be given access to the vaccine per the current CDC guidelines. Fine. Um, thank you for your time. And um, we really appreciate all the work that the commission has done in the past and will continue to do on behalf of farm workers. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Marin, would you be able to submit your comments in writing to the commission, please, for a uh, follow-up by the department? Yes, yes, um, Chair Clayton, I certainly will do that. Okay, and um, Ms. Sanford, can you just give the, ad, the email address that she would submit those to, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Marin, our um, email address is mdcr-info at michigan.gov. Thank you very much. I will make sure to send that over um, as soon as I can. You're welcome. Thank you. And that email address has been put into the chat. Comments from any commissioners um, at all? Okay. Thank you. Ms. Sanford, who's our uh, next speaker? Yes, we have our next speaker um, identified by as a caller by the last four digits of 8973. If we can have that caller brought over to the panelist list. Thank you. Hello, caller. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, caller, please. Okay, thank your, you. Please uh, state your name and uh, city from the record, please, for the record, and you have two minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, through the chair. Happy New Year. My name is uh, Michelle George, and thank you for this honorable board. Um, 
My condolences to Commissioner Roberson. Your dad was a jewel. I used to watch him as a teenager um, in the courts when we were down there for school. And also, um, Sheriff Napoleon was a heart of gold. Uh, he spoke to our church about the Lord's service. Um, I just want to make a comment that, um, and we couldn't get nurses on the phone because we were very busy, at, of course, at this time. But my comment is that, and I brought before the board again that, and I told the nurses I was going to make this public comment again, that we would like a hearing on facial recognition. I made a complaint, not so much, we, I made a complaint to get a hearing. I keep getting these letters of denial, how does it hurt you? And my, my issue is, as a nurse, and I just did a video on racism in your health, that as I see what's happening with my people, even Dr. King stated that the racial injustice back over 50 years ago is still a burden of America's shame. And so my, even as we see all the crime in Detroit and trying to work with the Detroit Police Department, the facial recognition, you cannot use it as a, uh, in a courtroom to indict someone. And it's only in communities of color. Now I know those uh, insurrectionists and domestic terrorists at the uh, on January 6th, they got a whole lot of facial recognition on their Facebook. But I would like to, uh, if I can through the chair, have a hearing on that. Also, with the civil rights, the state, and I, and I used to, I go to D.C. a lot. I was in D.C. last time pre-pandemic in February to speak to my senators. We have a financial review commission. I told Senator Peters this, still over our city with Governor Snyder putting that in place, the former governor, because he didn't feel blacks would fit the rule. I would like to see, and I wrote the governor respectfully, this FRC that meets on the fourth Monday when I'm trying to get on the call, if I'm not teaching my students, to be, dismo to be demolished. Because we have the structure of racism, systemic, dealing with the bankruptcy. So as a nurse, and I spoke um, through a, one of the film producers a few years ago on this FRC, we would like to have a hearing on that through the chair. And that's my comment, because as I see this, and I make my comments before the FRC when I get a chance, I would like to see this board investigate that because all of my letters are always denied. And as a nurse, it burdens my spirit to see my people still suffering Racism will be here to the day we die. However, we are called as a black person in the movement, as Dr. Barber stated. I'm a member of National Reverend Sharpton's group, and we talk about this. We couldn't go to New York this year, but this is something that I would like to have dealt with with this board. So thank you for hearing my, um, uh, my comments. Thank you. Ms. Snapper, do we have anyone else for public comment? Okay. Chair Clayton, I am just taking a look through the participant list really quickly to look for any raised hands. And we are done with public comment. Okay, thank you very much. And public comment is now closed. Our next item on the agenda will be guest presentations from the state's various ethnic uh, commissions. They, uh, is Ms. Trent, an attendee, has she been brought over as a panelist yet? Kimberly Trent. Someone can let me know. Yes, I'm here, um, oh, Chair Clayton, okay. thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I have the privilege of introducing Kimberly Trent who is the Deputy Director for Prosperity with the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. She is going to give an introduction for our various ethnic commissions that we have, which formerly were under the direction of the Department of Civil Rights, but they are now under uh, LEO, Labor, Economic, Labor and Economic Opportunity under the Governor's Office. So Ms. Trent, thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Chair Clayton and Commissioners, I really wanna thank you so much for um, inviting me to offer greetings uh, before you, you hear from our ethnic commissions. Um, I'd like to also um, congratulate the commission's officers and extend a warm welcome to the newest commissioners and express um, gratitude to the, for the service of our um, departing, your departing commissioners. And if I um, might have a moment of personal privilege, I'd like to especially acknowledge my friend, Laura Kopak as she leads the commission. Um, I'm very happy to be here today to represent the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity, where I serve as the Deputy Director for Prosperity. 
um, and also the equity and inclusion officer for um, LEO. My portfolio at LEO includes the Office of Global Michigan, which houses the Commission on uh, Middle Eastern American Affairs, the Asian Pacific American Affairs Commission, and the Hispanic Latino Commission. My division also includes the Michigan Women's Commission, which, as you mentioned, was most recently housed at the Department of Civil Rights and um, also a newly established commission, which is the um, Black Leadership Advisory Council, who you'll hear from tonight. And we believe that Leo's Prosperity Division is the perfect home for these bodies because many of them are um, working so diligently to ensure that Michiganders from ethnic communities have access to prosperity and opportunity. Um, Governor Whitmer has been very intentional about uh, amplifying the need for state government to demonstrate its commitment to racial equity in meaningful ways, such as the creation of the interagency environmental justice response team um, and the coronavirus task force for on racial disparities. Um, additionally, Governor Whitmer has mandated that every state employee undergo implicit bias training and that every department appoint an equity and inclusion officer. And as I mentioned earlier, I do serve in that role for the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. I'm also very excited to serve as lead staff to the, as I mentioned before, newly established Black Leadership Advisory Council, and you'll be hearing from their um, co-chairs today. Um, I am um, really, again, very grateful that you're going to hear from these bodies, hear about the work they're doing, and I know that all of them deeply respect the work that you're doing there with the commission, with the Civil Rights Commission, and would like to work collaboratively with you to build a more equitable and inclusive Michigan. With that, I thank you again for inviting our team to your table today, and I look forward to future opportunities to work with you. Thank you, Ms. Trent. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank Our you. first presentation is going to be from the Black Leadership Advisory Council, the co-chairs, Ms. Michelle Riley and Mr. Robert Womack. Floor is yours. Thank you very much um, to the chair and to the commissioners and the director and staff. Um, I would like to thank you so much for having us present. I bring you greetings from Detroit, where we just launched a year-long celebration of arts and culture in Detroit's uh, contributions to American excellence. I'm the director of arts and culture for the city and I serve as co-chair of the commission uh, with uh, Commissioner Robert Womack, who is also here. The council's charge from Governor Whitmer was to review and recommend policies and actions to eradicate and prevent discrimination and racial inequity. We also will seek to remedy existing structural inequities in Michigan. And we have identified four areas of focus, which Commissioner Womack will now tell you about. Thank you so much, Co-Chair Riley. The four areas of focus for the Black Leadership Advisory Council will be community safety and justice, education, health, as well as business and economic equity. We're going to identify state laws or gaps in state laws that perpetuate inequity and work toward promoting equity for the Black communities and residents across the state. We also will serve as a resource for community groups to learn more about state funding and compliance requirements within state government to benefit and advance community interests. And on a special note for me, we will also promote the richness of African-American culture and arts through coordinated efforts, advocacy, and collaboration with state government. Our goal is to change the narrative, view, and lives of Michigan's African-American residents. We thank you so much for your time and are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from any commissioners? Commissioner Combs? Yes, both to um, Mrs. Riley and Mr. Womack. Um, uh, this is a relatively impressive, the presentation that you're currently giving us. Um, my question uh, has to do with your thoughts in the area of business and economic equity. In another life, I serve on the uh, Michigan Business League which used to be the Michigan Black Chamber of Commerce. And the conversation has come before the commission about federal affirmative action set asides and the problems that we have been having for the past several years, um, decade plus, I should say, and seeing to it that there is equity in the distribution of contracts across the 83 counties when it comes to uh, these particular municipalities and, and private sector businesses receiving federal dollars and are required to have a level of participation from the minority community. 
uh, that is reflective of that community. Uh, we estimated that uh, probably close to a billion dollars in business and uh, economics is lost in the various communities across the 83 counties of the state of Michigan, when in fact, uh, there is no realization of participation of these particular small businesses that are part of the Michigan Business League, i.e. the Michigan Black Chamber of Commerce. We've had several meetings with the uh, Caldine Chamber, with the Hispanic Chamber, the Asian Chamber. We've um, mused over these things and uh, we've spoken even to those who work with Dan Gilbert and others in the city of Detroit who claim they cannot find uh, qualified personnel to participate in the contract process. And it was my understanding that there were conversations with uh, your body, uh, Mr. Womack and Ms. Rowley, uh, relative to trying to address this issue from a standpoint of a, a strategic plan that possibly could be pursued to close the gap. So that in fact, um, economic equality that Dr. King spoke about, spoke about can become some sense of reality in our communities in this contract process. I could use a lot of different illustrations, but I don't wanna get into uh, calling names and citing situations and circumstances. We're just saying as a commission that we were committed to trying to address this issue of contracts with the state of Michigan, contracts with municipalities in the various counties, contracts with black businesses in the private sector so that they can get a piece of the pie. Your thoughts. Um, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, for the question. I can tell you on behalf of the 17 members of the commission, that is why that's one of the four focuses that we plan to uh, make sure that we pay attention to and write strategies for. I, I think that um, the, the way we talked about it in our very first meeting was to look at black wealth and to look at inequities that prevent black wealth from happening. So on behalf of the commission, I can tell you, we'd like to work hand in hand with this body, other bodies and state government for those remedies. On behalf of myself, and speaking only for myself, I can tell you that at some point we have to stop asking people to do the right thing and remind them that these are invoices, their bills due for service and for inequities of the past. And whenever I'm talking with the commission members and my fellow commission members of council, I plan to make those points. Yes, I um, would like to also chime in commissioner, being a county commissioner myself, Mm -hmm. I've also seen in government when it comes to the contracts and the competition that are out there for contracts that there are too many counties that are very happy with a one to three percent minority participation and that minority participation not only including African Americans, people of colors, but also uh, white females. And when that participation is as low as three to five percent, the majority are happy whether there's 12% African-Americans in that community or upwards to 40% African-Americans. And I think that those contracts should be uh, reflective of the population. Also, the way that it's advertised when these contracts are uh, up for grabs, a lot of it is the good old boys club, where as soon as we leave the meeting, those phones are ringing, um, but there's never really any true advertisement and marketing to the minority community for these contracts. It also hurts me uh, when I'm pushing for more minority participation um, where there are people that will say that minority contractors may not know how to fill out the paperwork or a lot of things that we proved false once they were given the information to uh, sign up for these contracts as early as other people. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I'm sure it's something your concerns are something that me and co-chair Riley can also give to that committee to try to raise the level of what we're truly asking for when we talk about business and economics and not only the entrepreneurships, but in a pandemic area where so many things have been shut down, the government money and contracts are one of the few things that are secure that are almost guaranteed to continue to come through the counties. In Kent County, we have a budget of 400 million hmm. and I, a year, and I'd be pretty embarrassed to tell you what our uh, minority contract participation is, but I can say we are working on it, and I am very happy that you brought up that question because uh, when it comes to social justice issues, not only are we 
are affected and, and very adamant at fighting for our social justice issues. And we get support from uh, progressives that come to our community to support that. But when we talk about uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's Poor People's Campaign, when we talk about equity, economic justice and equality, once you mention economics, minorities don't get as much support from anybody on the outside when it comes to economics. So this is definitely something I want to look into as well as managerial racism while I'm a part of the Black Leadership Advisory Council. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I'd like to respond if uh, the chair would allow me to. Commissioner Combs, um, we'll let you go and respond. We do have Commissioner Kosa Jaru and Commissioner Lara who also wanted to speak. And we want to remember we do have um, other presentations that are coming up. So if you can go on and be brief and then we'll continue with the other two commissioners. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, to um, Mr. Womack, uh, two other things when you all began to have your conversations, you, if you could add to the list of discussions is one is the bonding of construction contractors where they're bonded out of the competitive process because the bond is too, ex the, the, the performance bond is too expensive. And Turner Construction put out an RFP some time ago, about a couple of years ago to the Michigan Business League, i.e. the Michigan Black Chamber of Commerce. And there were a number of African-Americans that wanted to participate in the construction going on with Henry Ford Health Systems over on, uh, right across the street from the governor's office downtown. But the bonding, uh, for the most part, disqualified them because they could not, um, uh, shall we say, afford the bond. That's one thing. Uh, uh, the other thing is, um, if in fact uh, you all continue to pursue this idea of equity in this area, it would be nice to get people involved that have some sort of creative modeling ideas that are working in other parts of the country. There are things that are working in Atlanta with Ambassador Andrew Young uh, who we worked with when we brought him here a couple of years ago to address the issue of the gentrification. I hate, I know we hate that word, the gentrification of the city of Detroit when Detroit was going through its emergency manager process. So if we could at least have some conversations with looking at modeling of some other uh, states that that particular, shall we say, model can be brought here to implement to work or to try to work so that we can bring about some equity because we've been having this conversation quite frankly too long and people are falling further and further behind and deeper and deeper in the hole. I'm finished, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Combs. Commissioner Kosa Jaru. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you so much, Chair Riley and Chair Womack and for your work for the Black Leadership Council. I personally have been a literacy advocate working with organization in the city of Detroit. I used to be a reading buddy. And I can tell you the only thing stopping a child in Detroit from achieving the peak of their potential is education. It's the beginning. It is a great equalizer, I feel. And you will have a strong partner with the commission and myself personally being a literacy and advocate. And I have done several projects and initiatives where literally just providing summer reading and summer activities for the kids has helped them uh, retain those skills learned during the academic year and bring them back stronger in the fall. They're very low cost initiatives that we can do and lots of other innovative things that we have tried across the years. And I would love to connect with you after this uh, to make sure that some lessons learned, small successes, but all pointing towards the clear path that with education, you also increase um, the equivalent opportunities, not only for economics, but better health outcomes. Those two have a direct correlation. Better or higher education leads to better health outcomes. So your four stated goals are inextricably tied together and they all will um, kind of propel each other. And I look forward to working with you in any way I can to help this area is particularly dear to me, the work that you're doing. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, thank you, thank you Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Lara. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Womack and Riley, uh, and uh, before I moved over to, uh, uh, over to the west side of the state, I'm in the Grand Rapids uh, west side of the state, Holland, Michigan. I was also a CEO of the Michigan Hispanic Chamber of Commerce based in Detroit. So I had had plenty of opportunity and 
to see the inequities in particularly in the construction industry as to how for uh, how minority companies can actually uh, participate in the building and in the Renaissance. And then uh, in a previous uh, life when I was working for a for-profit company that I was working for Jervis B. Webb as a vice president of program management, where even a company that size couldn't bid on certain projects because we didn't have the bonding capacity to do so. And so I can imagine the difficulty for smaller firms that are just starting out that don't have a track record to try and get uh, completion bonds for that. Uh, and I will say that the items that you speak of are not just limited to Detroit or Southeast Michigan. I see the very same issues, uh, particularly in Grand Rapids where there is, has been construction going on all the time and there's even more construction. And, and that is one of my uh, concerns is that uh, uh, minority owned firms don't share in that wealth and in that wealth creation because I know some of them and I know that they are more than capable of performing uh, the jobs that need to be done. So I support Commissioner Combs in his, uh, in his uh, zeal to understand and make certain that, that this issue is addressed. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Lauer. Thank you, Commissioner Ryle and Commissioner Womack for being here with us this evening. And just wanted to let you know that following up on what my fellow commissioner said, uh, the end of last year when the commission was determining what our work was going to be for 2021, two of the key areas was, were um, education equity and economic equity. So look forward to working with your council on doing this work and moving forward. Any thank other commissioners with comments? Thank you so much and thank you for joining us this evening. Look forward to working with you too. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm me. sorry, one more thing. Uh, is there a website uh, if anyone wants to, if anyone watching or listening wants to learn more about the Black Leadership Advisory Council, when you meet, who the other members are, do you have that? We are forming that website now. It does exist with labor and we're adding uh, the, all the rest of the information in the coming weeks. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Our next presentation is the Commission on Middle Eastern American Affairs. And that's Manal Saab, who is the chairperson who will be speaking to us. Is Ms. Saab here? Good evening, commissioners. Good evening, Good evening. Chair Saab. And thank you, you, Madam Chair, for inviting us to participate and including us in your meeting this evening. I, um, I think I'm on and everybody could hear me now. Yes, ma'am. So uh, the Commission on Middle Eastern American Affairs is a six year old, 15 member commission serving in an advisory capacity to the governor on issues relating to the Arab and Chaldean, Chaldean communities in Michigan. Our charge is to promote awareness of our culture and history, to empower uh, and advance the Middle Eastern American community in the state of Michigan, which is, uh, as you might know, is the largest ethnic community in our state. Um, I've been listening to a couple of the public speakers and uh, we definitely share many of the same issues from um, the caller earlier, the nurse and the educator that talked about racism and uh, to construction. It seems like um, regardless of, uh, of uh, who we're representing, the, we're all in the, minute, in the minority. Uh, socket within the state of Michigan, and we tend to face some of the same um, issues in our communities. I will uh, go ahead and talk a little bit about what we have done, and it's been completely a different world for us since obviously the beginning of the pandemic. We've had an incredible challenging uh, year in 2020, and we had to be bold in how we extended our services to our Michiganders be responsive in our grant making and exceptional in our collaboration. Like you and everyone else, we were faced with a truly uniquely trying times so transforming our outreach into a virtual world, uplifting the burden of the pandemic to whatever extent possible through partnerships 
and courageous actions to help Michigan thrive. Pre-COVID-19, we were alarmed by the uprising of racism affecting our community. And there was a period, as I'm sure many of you may have noticed, where there was even introduction of many pieces of legislation that divided us instead of united us, uniting us. So we launched early on a Simia Lunch and Learn event that was co-hosted at the time between Speaker Pro Tempo uh, Jason Wentworth and Representative Abdullah Hamoud at the Capitol State in uh, at the Capitol State Building in Lansing. Seventy-five legislative leaders from both sides of the aisle, uh, the House and the Senate, attended this two-hour lunch and greet to learn about uh, the Arab and the Chaldean community in our state. As our community adapted to COVID-19 crisis, we pivoted to be responsive to the demands and changes in our state. Our COVID-19 response strategies were grounded in three pronged approach, connect, strengthen, and mobilize to help lead through crisis and that commitment is ongoing today. We quickly transitioned to be hyper-connected with a new series of online peer convenings, education and engagement opportunities, and timely conversations with policymakers, economic and public health experts to understand and be able to communicate a rapidly changing world to our communities. We hosted our conferences in safe, engaging way with a robust menu of resources, speakers, and peer learning opportunities. We have remained focused on people, um, on listening and understanding the needs of our Michigan communities. Uh, we supported the MEA social services providers in their efforts to optimize the technological systems uh, to continue uh, providing the services our Michiganders needed in an e-communication format. We can't assume that every uh, small social service organization um, found it easy or had the money or the resources uh, to immediately shift and continue and maintain um, providing and being a resource to their constituents and to, to, to their community under COVID. So, we kind of jumped on that quickly and tried to assist where we could there uh, using CEMIA funds and resources. Um, it was very important for us that at a, more than ever now and during the pandemic, that none of the immigration, the webinars uh, and the services provided by our social services agencies would be paused by any means because although we were locked in, the needs were still there. As you know, also COVID-19 has dramatically increased physical and mental health challenges. As a result of the spread of the virus, we have seen a dramatic rise in the number of domestic violence victims um, who are facing unimaginable environments as they, along with young children who are not able to attend school are imprisoned, um, if you will, with their abusers staying at home um, while we were in lockdown. So Simia is lucky to have around the table a representative from the largest social services organizations, not just in Michigan, but being Michigan being home to the largest ethnic uh, Middle Eastern community these organizations are also the largest in the United States, which made really Simia's work much easier to collaborate and zoom, zoom in and partner to, to cope with the frightening and the stressful situation brought about by the pandemic. Um, so most of our work really in, in the past um, year has been to support and collaborate with our social services partners in their mental health services and the resources in a virtual format world. 
over the last few months, thousands of virtual therapy and telepsych sessions, peer support workshops, uh, case management services have been offered to children, adults, uh, families, and domestic violence, sexual assault, torture survivors. Again, we're lucky to have around the table representative of these large organizations. And we are, we continue to do this work. We're also having webinars that are open to the public that have been extremely successful. We launched our webinars with the first one with Dr. Sarah, who is a um, licensed psychiatrist. And she had addressed uh, the topic of substance abuse and mental health abuse. And our next webinar is in the works now to address um, the vaccine. We are working with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services uh, to put that webinar together next. I don't wanna take too much of my, too much of the time. We're given five minutes and I will pass it on to any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Saab. Any questions for my colleagues? Okay. That means yeah. you covered everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> Commissioner Collins. Uh, yes. Now, I, I'm just, I have a, a, an inquiry of a question um, relative to the, the county and population and the Arab population. Now, mm -hmm. uh, here, I'll preface that with some history. Uh, I worked with the Arab population in Dearborn for a number of years from 2000 to 2008. And so the, the Arab population in Dearborn if it's not too intrusive, I'm curious as to what the number is. Uh, my understanding it was about 400,000. It's, uh, it's much more than that. It's much more than that now. I, in, I don't have the numbers now because we haven't had, uh, we've been trying with the US Census to have a separate Arab uh, classification, uh, but obviously we were denied having that. But the numbers are much more than that. I don't, let me get you the numbers. Are you looking for the state of Michigan or only Southeast Michigan, which is really uh, where the most of the concentration is? Well, I have more so of the economic numbers because I, you have to understand that uh, the middle, the commission represents the East Levant, which does not involve, for an example, it doesn't include Iraq. It does, I'm sorry, it doesn't include the Gulf. It does include Iraq, it includes Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, Yemen. However, it doesn't include North Africa, Egypt, uh, Sudan. And really these are all Arab countries. So when we look at the numbers of uh, Arab and Chaldean, there's so much more than just what is given under the commission. But I could tell you from an economic perspective we contribute $40 billion a year economically to the state of Michigan. And unfortunately, um, from an identification perspective, for an example, the, um, the feds um, classify the Lebanese, I'm Lebanese, they classify us as white. Um, mm -hmm. Many of us are starting to write in uh, other as uh, Arab American, but any, to this day, immigration, when you have people coming in, we are classified depending which country you're in from the Middle East uh, in, a, in a different, uh, in a different uh, light. So again, uh, uh, with respect to the numbers, you don't have those at this point. And again, you're Lebanese Christian or Muslim? Neither, I'm Druze. Okay. Druze so is the smallest minority in the world. Okay, now what about the Arab population in cold water? My understanding is there's a sizable Where Arab is cold water? Is that in Michigan? <laughs> yeah, it was right next to Jackson where I live. And oh, okay. There, there's a sizable Arab population that's very involved in politics there. And then uh, the, the Chaldean population, I'm a, it's, I was under the impression that it's in Troy. The concentration of Chaldeans are in the Troy, southeastern Farmington Hills, Oakland County area. Is that accurate? Is that not accurate? Is Do you know? That, that is Accurate. I have to tell you, the Chaldean community, um, I would hate to say just in Troy, but you probably have that information because they have 
um, in Sterling Heights is where the ACC and the Chaldean Foundation are headquartered. But the Chaldean, and because their golf and country club, one of the golf country clubs that they own is in Troy. Right. Uh, the Chaldean community owns 75% of the um, liquor licenses for the entire state of Michigan. So just to give you an idea, most of the Middle Eastern community are in the field of entrepreneurs where they own their own businesses or medicine, engineering, and law. And what about groceries, grocery stores? Yeah, owning their own businesses, exactly. Entrepreneurs, gas station, uh, restaurants, uh, grocery stores, yes. Um, and, um, and in terms of from a professional perspective, medicine, law, engineering, and, develop, and building real estate sure. construction. That's impressive. Uh, um, Commissioner Saab, you, um, oh, thank you, Commissioner Elder. You said 75% of licenses. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Which, what licenses? 75%? Liquor. Oh, okay. alcohol. Okay. Liquor. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Al Hassan, your hand was raised. Yeah, I just wanted to simply extend my thanks uh, to Ms. Saab and her leadership on this uh, commission. I know you've served in that capacity for a number of years, uh, certainly have done great work uh, coming out of the commission uh, and really raising the issues and lifting those types of statistics that you're talking about, because I think they don't get recognized or appreciated or acknowledged even unless we're talking about it and having that conversation. So I appreciate you noting that. And I certainly appreciate your questions, Commissioner Combs. Um, very valid points, um, but I have to agree with Ms. Saab. It's so difficult to um, sort of generalize those numbers when the fragment of the population is divided so um, heavily. You know, you talk about, you, you, you ask the question, you know, are you Muslim or Christian? And learn that there's not, uh, yeah, another sect. Um, and so we talk about Arab countries and communities and then we look at the commission statistics and what were designated and you just cannot line up the numbers appropriately. You can't get a good read for what those populations are like, where they exist, where they live, where they choose to, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, details that are missing because um, of the designation. And quite frankly, it goes back to the census why we fought so heavily to get that designation. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of pride. It's a matter of, again, knowing where your populations are and what communities you're serving. Um, hopefully we can start that conversation again, uh, given the new administration and uh, maybe maybe we could see some change in the future. But um, thank you so much for, for your comments today and, and certainly your leadership on that commission. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Alassane. Any other questions or comments from any other commissioners? I would only say that it, obviously, uh, Juris Dr. Alassane is going to be able to educate us on this commission about these kinds of things and will be very helpful in our efforts to support uh, this very extraordinary lady's presentation. There's, um, we did do a, uh, a number and an economic uh, development report early on when the commission was put together um, six, seven years ago. And all that information is at michigan.gov slash semia. However, I do want to, again, say, please be mindful that it does not, it's not inclusive. It's not accurate numbers, which is why I try to stay clear of pinning the numbers down because they're just not legitimate and, and valid and not inclusive. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Commissioner Saab. Thank you. And thank you for all that you're doing at the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. When we were first, uh, um, when we first came to existence under Governor Rick Snyder, we were at MDCR and then we moved to Lara and now we have a very nice home under Leo and uh, it's been a great partnership. But thank you all for all that you do for our state. For much needed work, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from the Asian Pacific American Affairs Commission. The chair is Ayesha Ghazi. And I believe she's also going to be joined by former commissioner Denise Grimm, I do believe. Very good. Good evening, commission. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my name is Maisha, my name is Aisha Ghazi Edwin, and I am the chair of the Michigan Asian Pacific American Affairs Commission. 
The mission of the commission is to advance the full and equal participation of Asian Pacific Americans in the building of a greater Michigan. We were established in 2008 by House Bill 6172. We're a 21 member commission and we represent various ethnicities, professional backgrounds, religions, and, ge and geographic locations across Michigan. We work with various stakeholders. We are housed under the Office of Global Michigan um, Labor and Economic Opportunity. And then we work in conjunction with the governor's office, Asian Pacific American organizations and communities, other ethnic communities, state departments and agencies, as well as closely work with the APA or Asian Pacific American Caucus uh, as part of the Michigan legislature. So as charged by us in House Bill 6172, we are broken off into various strategic initiative groups. So various commissioners will join these groups and they're essentially task forces and they help us divide the work that we need to do. So I'm gonna break down a little bit of some of the work that we've been currently doing. Um, SIG 1's job is to collaborate with policymakers to educate and support programs and policies. Its job is to run the Asian American Engagement Coalition and to reach out to APA community organizations. SIG 2's job is to capture APA community concerns and issues, and they plan a leadership forum with APA community leaders, and they, and they, help, um, they help constituents to talk about their issues and concerns. SIG 3 is equality of access and civil rights. And SIG3 really helps to document and promote the experiences of Asian Americans, whether it be the history of discrimination and racism um, that's, that's currently happening or that has happened in the past. For example, a bar to nationalization, reminding people of the Chinese Exclusion Act and Japanese internment, um, the Vincent Chin hate crime case that happened in Highland Park, Michigan, and the rise of anti-Asian American sentiment during COVID-19. And then SIG4 is recognizing and promoting APA's contribution to the state of Michigan. And currently they're working on a national APA day, which is celebrated at the Capitol. And May is also Asian Heritage Month for our nation. Um, there's, and there's something else that I'd also like to just remind the commission of. So Asian Americans as a population is extremely diverse as was shared by you know, the former chair of the Middle Eastern Commission we're often lumped together into one census group, but we are South Asian, East Asian from a variety of backgrounds and religions. And because the data is not desegregated, we often, what ends up being lost is the disparities that exist among us in terms of poverty and in terms of discrimination. Um, Asian Americans have historically been discriminated against in policy from Chinese Exclusion Act, Japanese internment, 9-11, um, Islamophobia, and then the current COVID-19 pandemic, which we've really seen a rise in hate crimes against East Asians. Um, we're aware that this group, MDR, MDCR, has a representative of the Middle Eastern Commission and the Hispanic community, and we hope that you will also seek an Asian American representative for the department. Um, we, think it, we think it's important that our issues are seen and exposed, and we're not just washed in this model minority myth that we're fine and you know we're all thriving, because that's certainly not the case. But I wanna thank you all for taking the time to listen to us. If you wanna hear more, or if you wanna see more information about the commission, um, please visit, visit michigan.gov backslash MAPAC. You can also email us at MAPAC at michigan.gov. And we're also on Facebook at uh, M-I-A-P-P-A-C. Um, Denise, would you like to add anything to what I just shared? No, I'm just here to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, you. Right. Before I go to my colleagues, uh, Commissioner Edwin or Commissioner Grimm, did either one of you all want to speak? I know, I believe it's the 30th of this month. Um, it is Fred Karamatsu Day. And in 2019, I believe the commission actually passed a resolution in his honor, and there may be people watching or listening who are not familiar with the work that he did as relates to civil rights. So I don't know if you wanted to just say a few words um, regarding that and regarding him. Go ahead, Denise, if you would like to share a little bit about Fred Karamatsu okay. Day. 
Uh, Fred Korematsu Day, um, we like to thank Governor um, Whitmer for announcing January 30th as Fred Korematsu Day. And Fred Korematsu is a civil rights um, icon for our community. Uh, during the time of World War II, he uh, declined going into the interim camps uh, for Japanese American. Uh, his case went up to the Supreme Court, but unfortunately it uh, was denied, uh, or maybe I'm not using the right words, but, um, well, let me just give you a little bit more information. So, you know, this is following after Pearl Harbor, uh, Korematsu defied the US government order to report to the assembly center after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He was convicted for his refusal and appealed his case all the way up to the Supreme Court, which ruled against him from six to three decision in 1944. After World War II, Korematsu moved to Michigan. His conviction was formally vacated on November 10th, 1983 with the US District Judge Marilyn Haw Patel uh, based on the information that the war office has was misled the Supreme Court with false allegations of espionage and sabotage. In 1998, Korematsu was honored with the Presidential Medal of War by President Bill Clinton. He continued the fight of civil war until his death on March 30th, 2005. So um, he is definitely a hero in our eyes in the Asian community. Um, I like to thank the commission, the Civil Rights Commission in recognizing Fred Korematsu. Thank you. Any questions or comments from any commissioners? Okay. All right. Thank you ladies very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we are going to hear from the Michigan Women's Commission. Speaking will be Shannon Gear, the Chief Strategy Officer. Yes, hi. Good evening, Ms. Garrett. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having the Michigan Women's Commission uh, with you this evening. Um, I th believe we are the last commission to leave MDCR, so we appreciate you having housed us uh, for so many years. Um, just to give a, a few updates, um, the Michigan Women's Commission held uh, facilitated conversations with women around the state in late 2019 and early 2020, back when we were still under the Department of Civil Rights. Uh, and we found in those conversations with women around the state that economic security issues were always top of mind wherever we went in the state. Uh, child care, paid sick leave, paid parental leave, pay equity, all of those were consistently ranked the highest uh, as matters of concerns for women in the state. And that was all before the pandemic shed the light uh, that it's shining on those issues now. Uh, so when the Women's Commission met for strategic planning retreat in March of 2020, just before uh, the pandemic shutdowns began, we uh, came out of our strategic uh, retreat with four new committees to address these concerns uh, that the women of Michigan were sharing with us. One is the Unlocking Opportunities Committee which is focusing on uh, the actions to uh, eliminate barriers to work choice. So things like childcare, paid parental leave, other types of caregiving leave. Uh, the second committee is the Financial Freedom Committee, which is working on actions to close gaps and increase access to wealth. So the Financial Freedom Committee is looking at uh, the pay gaps and pay gap uh, not, not just based on gender, but across uh, race and ethnicity. How do we close those pay gaps? How do we help the women of Michigan uh, gain access to higher paying jobs, um, the jobs of their choice? Our third committee that, we're, um, that we came out of those conversations with is the Visible Authentic Leadership Committee. And that is where we're exploring policies that will increase the number of women serving in publicly visible leadership roles across sectors. So how do we get more women CEOs, women in the C-suites, uh, 
women in elected office, um, foundation boards, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and then our fourth committee is an overarching committee for the Michigan Women's Commission. It's the Committee on Implicit Bias, Bias Awareness, uh, which is an internal oversight committee that we're using to provide sort of ongoing uh, learning opportunities for commissioners to identify, acknowledge, and minimize bias as it shows up in ourselves, in the work of the commission, and in the policies that we're recommending. Uh, and it's also to help us de um, develop a common language and lens that we're looking at these issues with across all of our committees. Uh, and then as we're uh, able to, whenever we can share those learning opportunities with the public, uh, we are, as policymakers, we're doing that as well. So across those issue areas, uh, that's when uh, Governor Whitmer decided that um, as the commission was moving to prior prioritize the economic issues that that was when uh, we moved in August from the Department of Civil Rights to LEO uh, in August of last year so that we could have more direct collaboration across the department within LEO. Uh, and the pandemic certainly gave a spotlight to a lot of these issues that we were already hearing about from women across the state. Um, but it definitely has uh, put more focus on that. So just real quick, um, one year ago for the second time in history, women held more jobs than men in the US economy. But today, after the pandemic, four times as many women have left the workforce as men across the country. Uh, on January 8th, it was reported that the US economy lost 140,000 jobs in December and that all of them were held by women. Uh, we've been working with the Michigan Department of Management and Budget to try to get research on how that data breaks down here in Michigan specifically. And what we found, what DTMB has found so far, is that an estimated 125,000 women in Michigan have dropped out of the labor force entirely since February of 2020. It's 125,000 women have dropped out entirely uh, it's a decline of over 5%. And the unemployment rate, so that was women who dropped out entirely. This is the women who are still currently looking for work, uh, but unemployed. Uh, that rate for women in November of 2020 was estimated at 5.6%, which is double the pre-pandemic rate of 2.8%. So Couple that with female dominated jobs being among the hardest hit uh, by the pandemic, um, especially around accommodation and food services, education and health services. Um, we're down a, a lot of jobs for women in the state. Couple that with uh, earlier in the fall, the Michigan Women's Commission did a child care use survey to try to find out how Michigan families were handling child care during the pandemic, uh, what it would take for them, uh, what they would like to see in order to feel comfortable sending their children back outside the home to childcare again, and then what they would like to see uh, out of childcare overall. And overwhelmingly, and this uh, survey was conducted before the vaccine was announced. Uh, so keep that in mind as we talk about this. But um, when we conducted the survey, overwhelmingly, parents told us that during the pandemic, they wanted their children in their home, cared for by themselves or close friends and family. Uh, but when we get into the quote unquote post pandemic uh, era, they would want the almost entirely flip flops with wanting to send them back out of the home into childcare uh, centers and home-based childcare. Uh, so one of the other things they told us that would help with that transition is uh, rapid testing, they would like to see rapid testing in childcare spaces, widespread vaccination, and strong health and safety protocols um, in childcare spaces to make them feel more comfortable sending their children outside the home again. So we at the Women's Commission have been working across the administration, across the government and sectors to try to introduce uh, and support and advance policies that will eliminate the barriers to women's work choices, uh, to increase women's access to income and higher wages, increase the number of women serving in publicly visible roles, 
and addressing bias in the policy making and outcomes. Um, so just today, uh, we announced with the Michigan Women's Commission that we are, um, we announced our RFP or our request for proposals in the Michigan TriShare Child Care Program, which uh, came through the budget last year and was housed within LEO and we've been asked to administer on behalf of LEO. The Michigan TriShare Child Care Program is a pilot project uh, that will take place in three regions in the state of Michigan where we'll have a facilitator hub who will work with local employers in that region to uh, help assist with access to childcare and that childcare, the TRI comes in and that childcare will be paid for by the a third by the employer, a third by the employee and a third by the state of Michigan. And so we're looking at this as one way that we can try to help uh, employees, um, particularly moms, uh, retain their jobs uh, by trying to eliminate childcare as a barrier to that. Um, we're also, as a commission, working with the administration on the pilot that the governor recently announced in her COVID recovery plan that would provide wraparound uh, support services to up to 400 single parents who are participating in the Michigan Reconnect or um, Futures for Frontliners programs. Uh, because one of the, the goals that we have is for those frontline workers who are taking advantage of this program, uh, a lot of them are women, a lot of them are single mothers. So how can we help support them uh, with childcare uh, and other supports to ensure their success? Uh, then two more quick points is that in uh, April, we're going to be launching our hashtag My Women Wednesday social media campaign to shine a spotlight on Michigan women um, and their visible and authentic leadership in the various sectors across the state. Uh, so some of you on this call may hear from us asking for a video or a, um, a submission of some type so that we can help spotlight you uh, in this work that we're doing to show that women are leading across the sectors and how can we help uh, inspire more uh, women to lead. And then finally, uh, in an ongoing partnership with the Michigan League for Public Policy, uh, we recently, earlier this month, the commission opened our fourth round of, um, of our 21-day racial equity challenge learning cohorts. Uh, and those are taking uh, the work that the Michigan League for Public Policy did in developing the 21-day challenge. Uh, we um, invite uh, women to participate to sign up for a cohort, they'll receive an email every day for 21 days containing resources to read or watch. And then on every seventh day, their cohort meets online to discuss and reflect together. And so we've been bringing women together from across the state to participate in that. And then finally, I'll just say additional updates and plans will be discussed at our quarterly public meeting, which will be tomorrow evening or tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so Tuesday, uh, January 26th at one o'clock is the first 2021 Michigan Women's Commission meeting. The meeting details and the Zoom link are on our website and it will also be live streamed to Facebook and YouTube. And our website is michigan.gov slash MWC. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Any Thank questions you. or comments from commissioners? Commissioner Lara? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Shannon, for uh, coming to us. So I have a question um, regarding uh, salary inequities. Uh, I realize that the state has barred, uh, you know, the, the state and government inquiring into salary history when uh, you're hiring or when they're hiring someone. Have you done any work? Are you doing any work with the uh, private industry or, or you know, because that's really how a lot of this in salary inequity starts. It's someone comes in at a lower salary and they don't realize what that salary range is. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, we are. We are actually in conversation with um, the DTMB, the Department of um, Technology Management and Budget to look at how we can survey private industry currently to find out what, the, what they're doing, where their gaps are and um, who asks those kinds of questions and who does not, so that we can get a baseline to then use for how do we educate, how do we create policies to, um, to address the issue more directly. So yes, it is the priority of the 
Financial Freedom Committee to be working exactly that angle. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Commissioner Coraval, your hand is raised. Commissioner, Cor I'm not sure if you're speaking or not, but you're uh, you're still muted. Emma, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I apologize for that. I'll get this figured out here eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, I was saying I have, uh, I've known Cheryl uh, Bergman for a number of years, and I think she's uh, a very uh, capable person. I've also been involved uh, uh, for multiple decades in uh, uh, promoting uh, women's rights helping women get elected to uh, political office. Uh, I won't mention any names uh, on here, but uh, I supported uh, uh, many, many, many that I've seen get elected, and I've, um, I'm proud of that. I'm kind of shocked by the numbers I've you talked about since COVID and uh, unemployment and taken out of the workforce. Uh, I'm curious, is that so because those areas uh, where they increased uh, workforce loss, were those fields dominated by women? And were they later, if hopefully COVID ever comes to an end, uh, do you expect a, uh, a rapid increase in the employment in those uh, same areas that I'm speculating uh, have been uh, uh, depleted and reflected in the unemployment uh, uh, decrease uh, by COVID. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, we don't know exactly where those jobs are yet. Um, these are just the top line numbers. DTMB is working on a report that we hope will come out by March um, that looks at that a little more closely uh, where exactly those jobs are. I do know that um, a number of those jobs do appear to have come from areas that have been uh, workplaces that have been shut down or dramatically decreased for a while and did not necessarily have work from home options to them. Um, we do know from our survey that we did around childcare was that childcare itself, regardless of the industry or the sector that uh, folks worked in, that that was a concern. If I was going to be at home uh, I would not be paying the dollars that it costs to send my child uh, outside the home to daycare or childcare. Uh, and so looking at, you know, when we can get a little bit more detail around where these jobs were or are, how can we help, how can we help them do, how can we help them do that at higher wages than they were making before? Uh, and how can we help them move up uh, as, as, they're working uh, in that field. Um, and childcare is a big piece of that, trying to make that more accessible and affordable. Um, and then, yeah, with the, the wage gap as it exists, that's another thing DTMB is looking into the wage gap for Michigan, uh, here in Michigan. And when you look at full-time year round work, uh, there's the pay gap that exists there. And then when you look at uh, part-time work, uh, it grows dramatically, the pay gap for women. So our goal is to try to assess um, the situation uh, as you were talking about, Commissioner, and try to figure out where exactly these jobs were lost and then what is the situation, uh, going back to Commissioner Lara's question, like what is the situation in those fields? So when we're transitioning women back to work, how can we help make sure that they're coming back without the pay gap? Uh, and that they're coming back maybe at higher wages than they were making before. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Oh, Commissioner Combs, and I just wanna remind my colleagues, we do have one more presentation um, for the evening from the Ethnic Commission who are just getting a little bit behind. Commissioner Combs. Oh, the question is, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. To, um... Uh, Commissioner Garrett, can you hear me? Yes. 
can. Yeah, I, I um, wanted to ask a question about, well, first of all, I wanted to uh, speak to the governor's vision uh, as it relates to health care. I think that she acted uh, more than accommodating and accordingly in um, executive directing uh, COVID-19 dollars to direct care workers and direct care staffs, uh, direct care staffs throughout the state in the 3,500 settings in the different uh, counties. Uh, certainly appreciate that. And even when those checks are issued because they are passed through dollars, uh, we put the governor's name in the check to, so that they can thank the governor. That said, um, that seems to me to be an area of advocacy that possibly your commission could focus on uh, with respect to the president announcing that he is going to push that $15 minimum wage. Mm -hmm. If he's going to push that from a federal level and those federal dollars from many, many are going to come into the state, as long as everyone's on the same page to make sure that the pass-through dollars that are received from the feds under Medicaid, Medicare, uh, translate into direct dollars that go to the workers on the front line of health care. That would be a major area. And also that would enhance, I would imagine, uh, job opportunities and incentivize those particular jobs for women to leave those jobs where there's less stability and move into the venue of health care, which is a growing industry. Your thoughts? I think that's a great idea. And I'm definitely going to, I've taken notes as you were talking to pass that along to the commissioners. Yes, yeah, and, I agree. You know, and, and, and let the governor know she's a good friend. Uh, kudos uh, on uh, being a forward thinking on making that move because that has made the difference between surviving and staying open and shutting down. Uh, the yeah. staff appreciate it. Um, and of course, it has to some extent stabilized the workforce to the degree that it can. Uh, obviously, when the $15 becomes a federal law, if it gets through, uh, both parties and the, of the legislature, the House and the Senate, then I guess we'll be smiling even more than we are today. Exactly. From thank your you. lips, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Ms. Garrett, for being here with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker and our final um, presenter for the evening under this agenda item is the Hispanic Latino Commission. And it's Ms. Monica Reyes, who is the chair and Felipe Lopez Sostatia, who is the executive director. Good evening to both of you. You may begin, okay. Ms. Reyes. Felipe, you can get started. Oh. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, can you guys see me? No, uh, we can't. Uh, interesting. <laughs> Interesting, let's see. Yeah, my camera's on. I guess it doesn't matter, right? Uh, buenas noches a todos. Espero que todos estén bien. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity for us to come here. Buenas uh, noches. Can, can you hear me? Yes, oh. you can. Hey. Commissioners can mute themselves if they're not speaking, please. So you, we're going to keep it brief. I know everybody's tired, right? It's, it's, it's past seven. So um, we're going to keep it very brief. Uh, the Hispanic Latino Commission has been around since 1974. It was created as an executive order and became, it became through legislation in 1975. And the reason it was created was because the Latinx community didn't have a voice at the table. Right, so there, a lot of things were happening and we didn't have a, 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 any, any saying anything. So it was created and it was created um, basically um, because at that time there was so much inequities and they still exist, right? Um, especially the pandemic has, has shown us, but we have 12 mandates and it's too much to go through them. So the way we break it down is is advise, build, and connect. So part of our reason is to advise the, the governor, the legislature, and then the, the different state departments, making sure that there's equity for, for the Latinx community. And then build. So the way we do that is by being in community. So prior to the pandemic, um, I myself 
uh, drove around 50,000 miles going all the way from Marquette to Adrian, every, almost every county, um, engaging with community to, to get to know what the needs are. And then finally, it's connecting and it's connecting the different organizations to each other so that they could work collectively and so we could set the agenda for, for whatever our needs are. And so we have 15 commissioners that are appointed by the governor. Um, they range uh, from, we have commissioners from all across the state and um, everybody has a different, different issues that, that exist in their community. So we find a way through Madam Chair Reyes to, to kind of set the agenda and what we're going for, because there's so much. And so one thing that I want to lift up before I, I, you know, pass the, 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 the mic to, um, to Madam Chair Reyes is that when the whole pandemic hit, stuff wasn't coming out in Spanish or any other language. And that's the first thing we, we noticed and we saw. And we quickly reacted and, and told the governor that nothing was coming out, not for the Middle Eastern community, the Asian community. And so those are the kind of things that we push hard when, when things like that happen. And, and that's why our voice is so important. And what I'll do is I'll send a report that we submitted to the governor and to the, to the, to the legislature so that you all have a copy of it. And if you have any questions, please reach out. But Madam Chair Reyes, if you could. Um... Thank you. So um, I wanted to go over some of the work that we have been doing, but um, basically we've been doing things to pr promote appointments of Hispanics to positions of influence, both public and private sector increasing the com uh, economic growth and stability in Hispanics for Hispanics and increasing awareness and support of Hispanic issues um, locally and statewide and promoting be better education and academic achievement for Hispanics. So like many other cultures, we were faced with unspeakable racism these last four years. And it went so far that we had to distribute to our community uh, information on what to do if you get stopped by a police or immigration. And you know, th that's bad. That's bad when we have to tell you how to act if you're stopped. Some families were harassed at their homes and regularly in our community and social media. And our goal was to advocate and provide information on their options and work with the Latino community uh, and organizations around the state and work with those affected. And we continue to make referrals, connect the dots, um, make referrals to Department of Civil Rights and organizations that were experts on different issues such as immigration attorneys, attorneys and health organizations. Most recently this past year, um, our commission worked very hard on, on the census. And um, we faced an uphill battle because of the political time, climate and anti-Hispanic Latino sentiment, of course. It, it was just troubling across the board because Hispanic Latinos are classified in no way. You know, we're white or maybe maybe black and, and we have no classifications. Um, people were hesitant about filling out. I, I got so many emails, you know, I'm not white or I'm not black, you know, so so what do we do? And they, they would just, you know, throw the uh, census out um, additionally, we continue to address uh, disparities in the COVID information and access to healthcare. Uh, we work to assure that all communications, as Philippe mentioned, uh, you know, that, that they were translated so that our different communities had access to this information. And we are now currently formed a special committee to work on the COVID issues, including the uh, vaccine and its distribution. And now we, this committee is going to be connecting uh, with, with other organizations to assure that um, we are uh, also be given access to the vaccines. Some of the other things is working uh, for DACA students who were the essential workers during this pandemic, and they continue to be, and, and they were not part of some of those um, benefits that essential workers received. So we have a group that is working on that. And we wanted to share um, some of our, our biggest success has been in partnership with other organizations and other Latino organizations around the state. And we continue to do that outreach. And as Felipe mentioned, he does travel a lot and we all do in our own communities. 
So um, I just wanted to mention that Hispanics account for about 477,000, about 5% of the population in Michigan. And I just wanna say up front, that number's wrong. And we know that because we have so many in our community that would not fill out the census, would not be counted because they didn't want to get in trouble or they didn't want people to know their information. And so um, I wanted to make sure and share that. And I wanted to give um, greetings on behalf of our 15 commission, well, 14 commissioners right now, we're waiting for one more appointment, but they uh, come from all walks of life. They're educators, business individuals, parents, home, home individuals, we have attorneys and um, just, just the whole realm. Um, but they are all as committed and as dedicated um, as we could want our commissioners to be. And we're very proud of our commissioners and very proud of the work that Felipe is able to do with the little time that he has um, to do everything. And so we thank you for having us here tonight. And we thank you for uh, taking note on the work that we do. Thank you very much, Commissioner Reyes. Uh, any questions or comments from civil rights commissioners? Commissioner Lara and then Commissioner Combs. Yes, uh, Commissioner Reyes, thank you so much for thank your you. presentation. And yes, I'm definitely well aware of many of the issues, particularly with COVID and the mm -hmm. census. Uh, and that's something that you know I keep an eye on as well, uh, since I, I do also look at the, the healthcare industry as well. But uh, mm -hmm. I did want to mention, uh, because you didn't, is that Juanita Bocanegra yeah. is now a judge Yes. in Ottawa County and we're very, very happy. Yes, very thank very you. Happy. Thank you, Commissioner Combs and then Commissioner Kosajaru. Uh, yes, Commissioner Reyes, um, I have a question regarding uh, a statement you made about DACA mm -hmm. being essential workers and then stating that uh, they're not receiving COVID pay, they're not receiving pass through dollars. They're, wh what is it that they're not receiving? No. Um, for example, future frontliners required you to fill out um, FAFSA. And in order to fill out FAFSA, you have to have social security numbers. And most of our doctor students do not have social security numbers. And a lot of them are still working on their, uh, their uh, citizenship. So they did not qualify for a lot of those dollars. And any benefit that, that um, the, the essential workers were re uh, receiving Many of that was missed through for our essential workers. And you know, they worked in the restaurants, they worked in, you know, education and at the colleges, they worked everywhere that we work, but we're not part of the, the benefits. Uh, but it is my understanding the DACA uh, personnel are in the pipeline for citizenship. That's what my understanding is. They, they it, it's, it's happening now, but it has not happened. So it's, it's in the works. So we're, we're very pleased that that was one of the first things that was in the pipeline. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Commissioner Kosa Raju. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on a couple of things. Well, one from the Michigan Women's Commission. I didn't get a chance to comment on one of those topics she brought about, which segues very nicely into what Commissioner Reyes has mentioned about disparities and especially for communities of color. When we were talking about women particularly and pay gap for women, and I know when we talk about pay gap, it sounds like it's a small amount, it's a few cents on the dollar, but it has been documented pretty much that over a 40 year career, that gender pay gap, especially for women of color, adds up to $1 million for one woman. That is a staggering amount. So when we're talking about gender pay gap and we throw these numbers around that it's, you know, women of color get 70 cents on the dollar or 52 if it's uh, Native American women, those numbers have become very real and are growing. And I think that's something that will intersect between all the work that we do. And I'm very happy that uh, Commissioner Reyes and the commission we heard from the Michigan Women's Com 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 Commission have uh, identified those as um, priorities for this year on the gender pay gap. And the second thing I wanted to comment on was what uh, Commissioner Reyes is talking about is the racism and what that has as a mental health burden, especially for children uh, who are dealing with this now in school. Yeah. 
which is a terrible thing that among all the things that growing up is a tough thing and adding racism and the escalated rhetoric of the last few years has taken a mental health toll. I want us all to be cognizant, uh, especially I think if I'm not mistaken, one in four children in the US now is of Hispanic heritage. Or yes, yes that, that is correct. And what I want to mention um, in, in the United States, but especially in Michigan, uh, the majority of the Hispanic population, Hispanic Latino population is ages, you know, um, I think seven to 18. So wow. it's a young population. That's the majority of this. So those are the individuals that are going to be the caretakers of the elderly. They're going to be in the workforce. They're going to be in the factories. And so, you know, we, we have our work cut out for us. Absolutely. And I just wanted us to acknowledge about those vulnerable children that we're talking about. It's a sizable population, yeah. both in Michigan and around the country, and as well as that the pay gap, when we realize that women are both working in the house as caregivers, as you know, they wear the multiple hats and actually get shortened on the pay end. So it, it, it becomes uh, um, it's something that we can't ignore anymore, especially in COVID. Then, as we heard, the number of women that have actually had to leave the workforce. So imagine those women coming back and having to take jobs. I mean, this is going to be a really tough road for economic recovery for both women as well as communities of color. And I just want to mention uh, something Commissioner Combs did, did mention about the DACA students. Um, even though they are in the pipeline, that, that, that pathway right now is a very difficult and long pathway. And I don't see anything happening that would affect anything that we're struggling with here in Michigan where the essential uh, worker benefits would come in. So we're having to seek an around the, 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 you know, the, the norm pathway for them to, to get anything um, in you know, education or additional education or any of the, you know, they're not getting those unemployment dollars. You know, they're not getting, you know, the, they're, they're broke right now because they can't work. Mm. So there's no pathway for them at this time. And we don't see anything happening for anything will be retro uh, for them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Mr. Reyes. Any uh, final comments or questions from commissioners? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you, Felipe. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, just thank wanted you. to... Um, let everyone know that I know we ran a little bit over with our presentations, but I thought it was important. I have been on the commission, this is my fourth year, and this is the first time that we have had um, joint conversations with the various ethnic commissions within the state of Michigan, even when they were under the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. So I just wanted to get that dialogue going and also to make sure that the um, representatives from the commissions know that the Department of Civil Rights is still here to be a partner with them because if there are any cases or issues regarding discrimination that the department has the authority and the enforcement regarding the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act. So just wanted to get that conversation started and through our operational arm, the department under Director White to continue that going forward. Um, our next item on the agenda, our division and other reports, I'm going to ask that the department representatives be brief in their comments. All of the reports that we're going to hear verbally, they are included in the meeting packets. So if commissioners have any detailed questions that is in your um, meeting packet, if there's anything you want to ask, please feel free. Our first um, presentation, which is segues nicely from the presentations we've just had, is a brief update on the enumeration study. And that is Maria, Marisa Gomez Garcia. Is she here with us? Good evening, Marisa. Marisa. Good evening, Marisa. Yes. Good, e good evening, Madam Chair, and good evening, Commissioners. Uh, this is Marisa Gomez Garcia, and I uh, work uh, with the Community Engagement Division. I am the um, Community Engagement Liaison for the Hispanic and Latino population. And I'm going to give an update on the Migrant and Seasonal Farm Worker Enumeration Profile Study. Um, the last one that was done was completed in 2013. In March 20, on March 25th, 2019, uh, the commission voted and that uh, vote was unanimous. 
uh, to do an updated um, stud, enumeration pro profile study. That mm -hmm. was uh, supposed to begin in uh, 2020. 2020. Uh, however, that did not happen. Uh, at that commission meeting as well on March 25th, 2019, um, the commission committed MDCR to provide $75,000 in support and to secure additional funding. Uh, the request for proposal uh, for the, you know, the study to be done in 2020 was completed and it was posted on March 2020. That did not happen because then COVID hit and um, it was canceled uh, because of COVID and other state budget concerns caused by COVID-19. Most recently, uh, the 260,000 that was committed by various partners has been reaffirmed and an updated enumeration profile study will begin on 2021. Um, the process, we, are, we are in the process of um, updating the RFP and reestablishing it um, in conjunction with uh, talks with all the partners, as well as me, who is the lead from MDCR and Mary Engelman. We also have an individual from Farmworker Legal Services that is not a monetary partner, but was brought in because of uh, their expertise and involvement with farmworker issues. There will be changes to be made to the original RFP that we were working to begin in 2020, 2020 uh, and we'll have to do some updates. A couple of the updates that we'll have to do is an update of the, of the dates and also uh, to include a requirement that the grantee place uh, safety protocols given COVID-19. We hope to accompli accomplish that by February, 2021. A final review with the members of the data task force of the Interagency Migrant Services Committee will occur in February, 2021. Now we will have to complete the amended RFP, post the RFP, look at whether we need to amend the memorandum of understanding that was completed previously by the partners and determine what other next steps need to be completed. And this we hope to complete in February, 2021. Uh, then we'll need to post it and we're hoping to post it by March of 2021. A quick overview of the uh, enumeration profile study that we hope to do in 2021 and start in 2021 is that it has two main purposes. One purpose is the census of all agricultural workers and that includes migrant, seasonal, year round. An example of a year round farm worker is a dairy worker and H2A temporary agricultural agricultural foreign guest workers and non-agricultural family members. The second purpose of this um, enumeration profile study is to conduct an agricultural worker condition survey. We hope to be able to look at, with that, we hope to be able to look at the conditions and issues farm workers face in Michigan. A couple of quick uh, things that we'll be looking at with regard to information that we seek to get from this um, agricultural worker condition survey is for example, um, demographic information, including race, ethnicity, national origin, age, gender of the agricultural worker and non-agricultural family members. Another example is the agricultural worker type. There are many others, but uh, we don't have a lot of time today. Um, we, the supporters of this study include the Interagency Migrant Services Committee that includes uh, such members such as the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Farm Work Legal Services, Michigan, Im right, Michigan Immigrant Rights Center, and other members. Another supporter is Governor Whitmer, who reinstated the 75,000 the MDCR had uh, committed before and asked that we carry out the study and that because it's a party and, will, and she wants to ensure that all monies if, were recommitted. Other part, the partners um, are the Michigan Department of Civil Rights, who is contributing 75,000, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, who is committing 50,000, the Michigan Department of Agricultural and Rural Development, who's contributing 60,000, the Michigan Department of Education, who's contributing 35,000, and the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity, who's contributing $40,000.
Uh, I'm going to mention a, a few reasons of why we need to conduct this enumeration profile study. Uh, for instance, it's just too outdated. We did not count year-round agricultural workers like dairy workers. Um, we did not survey uh, farm workers before when we last did it in 2013. Um, supporters use this information to uh, the count and the data to de determine programs and fundings. For example, Telemann Corporation, who provides daycare services to farm workers who come and uh, harvest our, our crops in Michigan. And they ne need this uh, to figure out when and how many daycares they should be opening and should be available for farm workers use. Um, the second largest business in Michigan is agriculture, and we need to attract and continue to attract farm workers and provide incentives for them to continue to come to Michigan. By doing the survey, which is the second um, purpose of this updated enumeration profile study, we'll know the reasons why they come to Michigan. Another example of why we're doing this um, this stated enumeration profile study needs to be done as the state of agri agriculture has shifted. For instance, dairy farms used to be operated mainly by um, the owners of the dairy farms. Many dairy farms nowadays have become very large and those farm owners have to hire immigrant labor to help them operate them. Now, many of those immigrants are Hispanic Many of the, the ones working in dairy farms are Hispanic and a lot of them are Mexican and uh, mo most of them do not speak English fluently. They speak um, mainly Spanish. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, any questions or comments from commissioners? Okay, thank you very much. And oh, Commissioner Lara. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm just really glad that this uh, enumeration study is going to be done because as you mentioned, the, the information we currently have is severely outdated and uh, trying to do programming or reach out to those communities is, is really, uh, I think we're leaving a lot of people behind uh, by using the old data. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as I mentioned, the full report is under Deputy Director Engelman's report in our division, I'm sorry, in the meeting packet if you have more questions. Next, we will hear from Alfredo Hernandez. And while Alfredo is coming over to give a brief update on the recommendations from the Education Equity in Michigan report, I just wanted to say that I was able to attend the first meeting of the council that's going to be working on implementing the recommendations with Director White and Alfredo in December. And it was just a great meeting, phenomenal work that they are doing with that council. We have representatives from MDE also join and I'll let Alfredo go into the detail, but um, there is another meeting coming up. I believe it's in February. I won't be able to be there, but I strongly encourage any other commissioner who is able to join for that meeting as they're just uh, discussing the recommendations to join. I think you'll find it very beneficial. So Alfredo, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the director, Madam Chair Clayton and the entire MDCR, MCRC team for the work that you do and for allowing me the opportunity to share with you this brief summary. Again, my name is Alfredo Hernandez, equity officer with the Michigan Department of Civil Rights. My goal today is to briefly highlight MDCR's Council for Government and Education and Equity and Inclusion. Uh, briefly before doing so, I'd like to provide a quick view of the work related to DEI training in the past year. Uh, it's very much connected to everything that's taking place so far. In 2020, the Equity Office facilitated at least 26 implicit bias workshops across the state. Some of the organizations who received training include the Department of Veterans Affairs, the City of Lansing, Eagle, the Office of the Attorney General, the City of Detroit, and the Michigan Gaming Control Board, among others. This year, we have already facilitated additional training with the city of Detroit. For the last three years, the Equity Office has been working extensively to be a valuable and reputable resource for training solutions across the state. And our work has placed MDCR as a leading expert in implicit bias training, as well as strategies to operationalize equity at the state level. 
our template to operationalize equity based on our internal racial equity and cultural competency initiative has been adapted by many state agencies as we continue to provide support. The equity office continues to work closely with the governor's office and the equity officer in the executive office to develop a more consistent approach that establishes additional guidelines and steps that can serve to increase transparency and accountability in the work of compliance and DEI work across state agencies. I can proudly and humbly say that NDCR's template, toolkits, and training solutions created to elevate racial consciousness and cultural competency continue to help shape and improve the infrastructure required to more efficiently, efficiently operationalize equity and honor and uphold the numerous executive directives designed to implement equitable and more lasting change. In our multiple efforts focused on prevention through education and collaboration, the Equity Office created its Council for Government and Education on Equity and Inclusion in October of 2018. The Council's purpose is to bring leaders and decision makers in the areas of government and education to engage in conversation about DEI, to learn about what's being done and not being done, and how we can hold each other accountable to the work of dismantling barriers to inclusion. The Council meets twice a year, and some of our guest speakers include national experts on DEI, as well as state leaders, including members of the executive office. Our council body is made up of approximately 70 volunteers from across the state, and most members play a key role in local government and education, such as city managers, mayors, county administrators, and superintendents. Based on the Michigan Civil Rights Commission recommendations in the Education Equity Report, we have expanded the existing Council for Government and Education and Equity and Inclusion to include representatives of the Michigan Department of Education and establish the council, the council as the entity responsible for implementing and overseeing recommendations for action based on the Education Equity Report. Our most recent session held on December 11th of last year provided a platform to introduce our new director, the chair of the Michigan Civil Rights Commission, the director of MDE, as well as to officially introduce MCRC's Education Equity Report. Our session led us to engage in conversation about strategies to pursue the work of implementing change based on the recommendations in the report. We have now created a work group centered on the recommendations from the report. Our first initial meeting takes place on February 5th, where we plan to discuss which recommendations in the report we can more efficiently target first, what other key players need to be at the table, as well as strategies and deadlines to measure, monitor, and evaluate our progress. The work group center on the equity report will meet on a monthly basis as we collectively assess the work that lies ahead of us. Based on the most recent survey conducted with the council, over 90% of the folks see the need to encourage schools across, across the state to create local school equity plans as a vital and viable priority among the recommendations in the report. I would like to conclude by uh, taking a moment to express my gratitude to Madam Chair Clayton and the entire commission for putting out such an important report and for the support provided during the initial transition of the report into the council. The equity office looks forward to leveraging the resources within the council to help operationalize equity across systems of education throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from uh, commissioners? Commissioner Collins. I, <clears throat> yes, uh, the, the question I have is relative to a comment that you made uh, relative to uh, your implicit bias training with the Department of Veteran Affairs. Did you mention that? Uh, yes, sir. And so, um, Alfredo, uh, what were your findings with regard to implicit bias in that particular department? Uh, with respect to their contracting with the private sector of the community or private sector contracts? And number two, do they receive federal dollars? Uh, just so, so that you understand, Commissioner, uh, a lot of the times when we come into uh, a state agency or an organization to provide training, uh, the, the capacity in which we come in is just as an educator. Uh, so we provided the implicit bias training 
for the specifically for the Department of, of Veterans Affairs. Now, depending on the organization and the agency, the resources, et cetera, we may be able to continue the work to go deeper, but specifically with the Department of Veterans Affairs, all we did was provide that one four hour training session, uh, provide a report to them in terms of our recommendations, uh, but nothing followed. So with respect to the Department of uh, Veteran Affairs, there really was no investigation into what their practices were with regard to bias uh, in contracting with the private sector and the inclusion of women and minorities in their contracts that they contract with the private sector. You didn't look into that. Uh, I did not look into it myself, uh, yet I cannot speak for the enforcement division and what they may have done from their end. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll rest my questions at this point, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from any other commissioners? Okay, thank you very much, Alfredo. Next, we will hear the director's report from Director James White. Good evening, commissioners, viewers, and guests. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to briefly uh, share some highlights and information since the uh, commission last met. Uh, as you are aware, I've served as director now for approximately five months, just over five months. In that time, we've made significant progress toward achieving some of the goals that I've uh, outlined for the department. We're now poised to move uh, towards the remaining portion of our strategic plan and our goal. I'm also pleased to report that our internal and external strategic plans are nearing completion. Uh, an area of emphasis with our strategic plan will be to increase our footprint in the state of Michigan and to increase and improve efficiencies with our investigative process, as well as to improve uh, our service delivery and provide excellent service to our residents and claimant uh, of the state. Certainly none of this will be possible if we don't first improve the morale in the organization. One of my top priorities right out of the gate was addressing the issue of morale, a problem that was clearly identified in the employee survey conducted by the commission uh, prior to my arrival. Uh, to that end, I have now concluded the one-on-one -on -one meetings with every Michigan Department of Civil Rights employee, including all division directors, members of the leadership team, and those members uh, provided me with the opportunity uh, to understand uh, where they, what they felt were the issues in the organization and, and from their perspective. Uh, we had those meetings in, in a no judgment environment. Uh, they shared a number of ideas and concerns with me in ways that we can improve the culture of the organization. Uh, these meetings were candid and eye-opening and gave me uh, insight into a range of issues that we must address uh, in order for the organization to grow. I wanna add that these conversations were not all negative. Uh, I was surprised and tremendously heartened uh, by the one common thread that ran through uh, each and every employee that I talked to, and that was their commitment uh, to the Michigan Department of Civil Rights and their vast array of knowledge about civil rights laws. And that was, that was as I indicated, very hard by, to, to hear that. Uh, they expressed deep concern uh, with the work environment, but it remained very positive about ways we could, we could do better. Many of the issues raised uh, in these sessions will inform my final strategic plan. Uh, some of those first steps have already taken place, uh, though uh, initial steps, one of the things that I did right out the gate uh, was to eliminate the staggered deadlines. Um, the staggered deadlines, uh, just in the interest of time as a process is used uh, in the investigative process uh, where the investigators have to turn in a number of uh, reports by a particular time. With COVID and a number of other issues that uh, the employees are dealing with, we, we thought it was a good idea to suspend those uh, for at least a while. Uh, one of the things that we are going to do uh, as we continue to uh, implement a strategic plan and talk through ways of improving the organization is look at best practices and enforcement best practices around the country, quite frankly, uh, as it relates to doing these types of investigations and what, what processes would better suit uh, the Department of Civil Rights as opposed to uh, continuing with the staggered deadline process. Uh, we'll be implementing uh, another process uh, for our leaders here, and that's the Strength Finder 2.0 training uh, for our leadership. This allows us to leverage uh, some of our strengths uh, and, our, and our leadership styles uh, to best suit our employee group. Uh, thanks to Deputy Director Mary Engelman and Kim Woolrich and others uh, in the Michigan Department of Civil Rights staff, uh, we held our first virtual holiday event. Uh, the attendance was voluntary, but I'm happy to report that more than 75% of our staff took part. 
though we made time for some fun, the event featured Dr. Sabrina Jackson, who is a counselor, uh, and she's also the author of Creating Magic During These Times of Uncertainty. Uh, Dr. Jackson facilitated a session on developing tools to cope with and manage unprecedented stressors of dealing with COVID-19 pandemic and working from home. It was well received uh, uh, by the employee group and we wanna continue uh, to build on that. The other focus of the training was the work-life balance. Just moving on now for, for some time and especially over the course of the last year, the Michigan Department of Civil Rights have seen a number of staff departures uh, I'm happy to report that the governor has recently lifted the hiring freeze and we are wasting no time and, and working to fill our vacant positions. Since the freeze was lifted, we have been evaluating all of our open positions and we are now currently in a process of filling 11 open positions in the areas of enforcement, law and policy, communications and community engagement. It's our hopes that by filling these positions, uh, eliminating uh, some of the burden of uh, high caseloads that, that that too will help with morale. We have established and are now seeking individuals for a voluntary student internship program within the department. Uh, we have posted several intern positions to help with community engagement, communications, uh, and the equity office. Very excited about that. I wanna thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for your assistance with that endeavor as well. Uh, I also wanna take this opportunity to announce two internal promotions. Hope they're not offended, but I'm gonna mention their names. We're gonna be a very transparent organization. Tracy Barbie has been promoted to intake unit supervisor in Detroit, and Sonia Merriweather has been promoted to civil rights manager in the Grand Rapids office. I'm super excited about those two promotions. They are two of my first that I've been involved in, and I'm very excited. Uh, I found both of those employees quite engaging, and I think their leadership will be be uh, well needed in the organization and, and uh, they will be providing us with great service. If they are watching tonight, again, I just want to publicly extend my congratulations. We've also hired Sheila McBride to serve as special projects coordinator within the executive office. Sheila brings a wealth of experience in both public and private sector and has already proven herself to be a selfless team player, uh, helping with various projects for the executive office, the communication team, and assisting Sylvia Ed Elliott uh, with planning, I better not get her name wrong. She's been working pretty hard for us. Sylvia Elliott with the planning, uh, the commission orientation and the instructional retreat. Uh, welcome Sheila. Uh, Sheila and Vicki and JJ, uh, Jeanette Johnson, I wanna make sure I mention they have uh, re-implemented the Crown newsletter. Very excited about that. And uh, they got the first issue out uh, as I requested uh, for January. I also want to announce that one of uh, the Michigan Department of Civil Rights longest serving employees Candace Chivas has recently retired with a total of 51 years of service with the state of Michigan. Candace served as the FOIA coordinator for many years, and we send Candace our best and wish her a happy retirement. Finally, uh, we continue to strengthen our relationships and partnerships with local government agencies, nonprofits, community advocacy organizations, as well as leaders in faith-based organizations, as well as also uh, leveraging uh, my relationships with uh, law enforcement groups around the state. Uh, I was very honored to attend a number of meetings in the last couple of months, um, certainly the governor's cabinet meeting. Uh, the, I attended the Coalition for Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing meeting on December 4th. Uh, I met with Steve Spritzer, uh, from the who is the president and CEO of the Michigan Roundtable for Diversity and Inclusion. I also attended a meeting with the uh, Council for Government and uh, Education and Equity hosted by uh, Alfredo Hernandez of our staff is, who just spoke. Uh, I addressed the NAACP Michigan State Conference 84th Annual Convention on December 12th. I was also a keynote speaker for the Detroit branch of the NAACP's monthly allies issues and action meeting. I'm very happy to have attended that. Uh, participated uh, in an interview with the Gangwer uh, News Group on December 2nd, and most recently attended the uh, Racism and Student Mental Health a virtual town hall meeting on January 13th. I tried to get through that as briefly as I possibly could. And now I am con concluded my report and available for questions. Thank you, uh, Director. And I just wanna say thank you so much to you and Deputy Director Engelman for getting the internship program up and running. That was one of the first things that I talked to you about. And I just believe internships are great ways to help uh, young people, especially college students, kind of figure out what it is that they want to do and provides experience for them and help for the department. So thank you. And I also was thinking that we might want to get a uh, intern for the commission also, but we can talk about that. All right, thank you. 
Uh, any comments from any of the commissioners on the director's report? Commissioner Combs? Uh, yes, um, Honorable Director, well, I wanna ask you a question about um, implicit bias. Are you ready? I'm ready, sir. Um, it, it looks like Alfredo Hernandez works under you, under your authority as the executive director. And That's so it, when he went in to do the implicit buying, tr bias training with Veteran Affairs and the Michigan Department of Education, it would appear to me that he would need to at least inquire uh, as to whether or not uh, those departments thought they were and or were in fact uh, participating in implicit bias. And one of the key areas that uh, you can find that out is by looking at whether or not they are fulfilling their federal affirmative action uh, requirements for contracting with outsiders with minorities and women. So it's, it's peculiar to me uh, that implicit bias training would be conducted in any department and they're not gonna be held accountable to things that they're supposed to be doing when they're receiving federal taxpayer dollars. Your thoughts? Well, I, I think that we have uh, two tracks. We have the investigatory, investigatory track with our enforcement group that I'll have to take a look to see if they are looking at an active investigation. And then we certainly have the educational track, which uh, Alfredo participated in uh, just from a global perspective as it relates to implicit bias. Uh, but I'd like to take a look at that and follow up with you, sir, uh, so I can give you a more informed answer. Well, it's that's extremely okay. important because if we're talking best practice and pat patterns and practices, it just would appear to me that uh, the governor already has identified that that is an issue. Implicit bias obviously is an issue. Otherwise, she would not be calling for uh, there to be training across the board in all of the departments that are under her auspices. So that said, and, and then we already know from uh, negotiating with Mike Shirky and the Michigan Senate and the folks in the House, the numbers are down, way down, as far as the numbers that they are um, uh, reaching to uh, contract with the private sector with minorities and women. So one to three percent is unacceptable. And uh, that's pretty common knowledge across the board. And so it would appear that the Department of Civil Rights could take a proactive approach to bring solutions to the table. Uh, and first of all, getting them to recognize that there is implicit bias and your numbers and the science shows there's implicit bias. If they cannot demonstrate that they're doing what they're supposed to do on the fe federal affirmative action guidelines, it's pretty obvious they're not hitting the numbers that they are encouraged to hit to be fair and equitable. So this is why this is gonna to continue to be brought up almost every time that it shows up on the agenda because it needs to be addressed and because the minority and women in our community have been suffering too long because there is no address. And I'm not talking about enforcement, I'm talking about finding ways to accomplish what the compliance guidelines are for receiving those dollars in contracting with these particular segments of the community. Your thoughts? If it pleases the body, I'd like to take a look to see where we stand as it relates to complaints. Uh, if there's any Elliot Larson complaints with regards to uh, anyone coming from uh, that that entity, uh, but at this point, I'm not prepared to really give you uh, a detailed answer as to where we are with investigations. Uh, but certainly, I understand exactly what you're saying, and it seems reasonable to me that if, in fact, they are not participating in the appropriate uh, activities, and there's an implicit bias issue there, we should be aware of it, and we should be actively engaged in it. But as the commission is aware, we launch at the point of complaint. Um, but at this point, I just don't know or know enough information about where we stand with complaints. And um, Director White and Commissioner Combs, I was trying to do a little bit of research while Commissioner Combs was talking. I do recall um, in 2020, Governor Whitmer did issue the executive order regarding implicit bias training. I thought it was somewhat, she was, had a limited scope and it dealt with healthcare workers as re, um, related to some of the disparities as it, uh, minorities and COVID. So I think that the, um, her executive order regarding training for implicit bias dealt with the healthcare field as it relates to COVID. And I don't know if Alfredo is still around, if he can speak to that. The other piece we did talk about, my commissioners, fellow commissioners will remember this at the end of last year, when we looked at what we wanted our target work to be for 2021. And one of those targets was a carryover and that is dealing with contract and economic equity so um, that's something we'll be talking about. I had a note under my reports to talk about that and to see if even someone's interested, Commissioner Combs, in chairing a committee 
on this particular topic to help the de uh, department and the commission in this area. So that's something that will come up in our instructional retreat. But Commissioner Combs, we will ask the director to uh, Alfredo to follow up and let you know exactly what the governor was looking for when she had the executive order on implicit bias training last year. Okay, okay. Um, any other questions for the director or comments on his report? Okay, our last division report uh, or other report will be from Attorney General Ron Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my, my presentation is gonna be brief. Uh, you have in your packets uh, the case summaries of important cases, but I'm just gonna give you a brief highlight on uh, uh, what we've been doing since the, the commission last met in November of, uh, the 23rd. Um, the Roush World um, uprooted electrolysis case, that's our LGBT case. Uh, we did file uh, in the, um, um, we did file on December the 28th, uh, an amicus brief um, uh, before the, um, uh, the Court of Appeals, an application for leave in that case. Uh, that was a case, you know, involving whether or not sex as defined under the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act did include sexual orientation and, and gender identity. The Court of Claims ruled in favor of the uh, gender identity claim, but couldn't uh, rule in favor of us with regard to sexual orientation because of a prior Court of Appeals decision uh, that they were bound to apply. Um, after our filing in the uh, Court of Appeals, the, the Attorney General decided that we should also file a bypass application for leave to the Supreme Court. Uh, the, the, the underlying issue could have been decided before the Court of Appeals, but <clears throat> as this matter is ultimately going to be decided before the Supreme Court, a bypass application would allow that to be uh, to get it before that court in a, in a more timely fashion. So we're still awaiting decisions from the uh, uh, Michigan Supreme Court, whether or not they're gonna accept that application and consider that matter uh, as a bypass issue. So I will keep the, the commission updated on that. Um, the Riverbrook versus Fabode case, that's the uh, emotional support animal case. Uh, an application for leave uh, to appeal has been filed before the Michigan Supreme Court, and that was filed uh, last uh, on the 21st. Uh, so we've been busy uh, filing am uh, amicus briefs in support of the commission's position with regard to that emotional support animal case. That will decide the issue of what the standard is for requesting an emotional support animal in Michigan. Uh, the Court of Appeals thought that we should apply an expert witness standard should be applied when those requests were made. That of course is contrary to this court's, uh, this commission's uh, uh, standard, uh, 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 standard applied in the very first emotional support can, uh, uh, animal case heard in Emick, uh, Christine Emick versus Royalwood uh, in 2004. Uh, so I will keep you apprised of that. Uh, the American Freedom Law Center case, we did file uh, our timely brief, uh, uh, a motion and brief for summary disposition uh, on on the 22nd of February uh, in front of the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Michigan. Uh, of course, that is a, uh, a claim where the uh, plaintiff's claim of First Amendment violation uh, of freedom of, of speech and freedom of association. Uh, discovery has been completed. And as I say, we did file a timely, uh, timely brief uh, and motion for summary disposition in that case, and we'll wait a decision on that. The last case is um, the estate of Robert Romig. That's a disability accommodation case. The Court of Appeals held that disability accommodations in terms of railings, et cetera, only extends to the initial real estate transaction or lease. So in other words, if, if you're not disabled and then request an accommodation at the initial purchase of the real estate, or the initial lease of real estate property, you're not under this under the Court of Appeals ruling, you're not entitled to an accommodation for such things as a railing for egress and, uh, uh, and, and egg, uh, egress or, or leaving your, your property. So that is the, that case, uh, we're waiting for the plaintiffs in that case to file their, um, file their application for leave to the Michigan Supreme Court. And then we will follow up with an amicus brief 
uh, in that particular case because it's just so contrary to um, to the state law and the, and the commission's interpretation of accommodations under the Persons with Disabilities Act. Madam Chair, that concludes my report and I'm willing to answer any questions that the commission may have. Thank you. Any questions for Attorney Robinson from anyone? None? Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Madam you. Chair. Thank you. The uh, next item on our agenda is commission business. First item is a chair report, which will be very brief. At our special meeting on November 23rd, former Commissioner Stafford made a motion to remove from the Education Equity in Michigan report the recommendation that charter schools be funded at 25% less than traditional public schools to balance funding and transparency in equities. As you recall, that evening we heard from speakers supporting both um, sides of that argument, supporting both positions. Commissioner Sackwa's motion was tabled to allow for a formal analysis of the funding structure of charter schools in Michigan as they compare to the traditional public school model. That analysis is being undertaken by Vanguard Public Affairs, who was the consultant on the original report. They will provide the commission with a comparative analysis of school funding structures and associated partners, um, patterns of expenditures of funds by February 12th. That will be time for the commission to review that report and then we will take a vote on that table motion at our March meeting. I do have one question for uh, attorney Levy or Sylvia Elliott. Since the motion was tabled by, the motion that was tabled was made by a commissioner who is no longer on the commission. At the time, will we need to have another commissioner make that motion or does it just remain you will. The, the motion comes off the table when the commissioner finishes the term. Okay. So we know that that is something that we're working on. We will just make sure that that particular item um, is on our March agenda for a vote. We'll just need someone else to make the motion at that time. Okay. Very good. Okay. Um, any questions from commissioners on that update? And that's Commissioner Combs. Yeah, at the time, then it would be appropriate for me to uh, at least voice my concerns that were dictated in the correspondence dated January 25th. Um, yes. Thank you. Are you going to are you going to read your concerns, Commissioner Cole? At that time, at the time of the motion. That won't be till March. Yes, well, again, we're not voting on it until then. So oh, okay. I've, I've sent the communication out and I, as I just said at that time, it probably would be appropriate for me to read the uh, communication, the correspondence that I sent on the issue on Jan dated January 25th. Okay, I know you sent it to me. Did you send it to the entire commission also? Or will yes, you? Okay, perfect. Yes, okay, okay. Um, the last item is that we need to select, Excuse oh, me. I'm sorry, Commissioner Laura, yeah. Yes. yes. Um, I'm not aware if there was any information presented in the uh, discussion regarding uh, the charter schools uh, uh, changes in um, um, the amount of funding uh, you know, for them. But what I'm really interested in before I can actually make a, a, a good decision on that is the makeup of the charter schools throughout the state of Michigan, you know, disaggregating the data by county and by demographic information, uh, you know, it would be really, it would be really helpful to me in uh, trying to decide how to uh, make that decision. Is, is such information available? So you're asking for the demographic makeup of charter school students in the state of Michigan? Right, also by county if possible. Okay. Um, I'm going to make a note of that and uh, everyone here is listening to have our special advisor, Sylvia Elliott, reach out to Dan Quisenberry. He actually spoke at our special, we actually had a hearing, a special meeting specifically on charter schools and about giving them an opportunity to speak. That was on November 23rd. We'll make sure that you are able to see the minutes from that, which are actually uh, should be in your packet, but we do have right. a detailed transcript of that. We have a detailed transcript. And if I'm not mistaken, there's also a recording of that meeting. So we'll make sure that you get that also. But I'm pretty certain Mr. Quisenberry would be more than happy to help us get that information for you. He is with the Charter School Association of Michigan. And I'm sure he'd be more than happy to help us get that information for you and for all of the commissioners. 
So we'll work Thank on getting you. that uh, so that you will receive that at the same time as you receive the February 12th report. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments from anyone? Okay. Um, so we need to, we're talking about our instructional retreat at this time, at this time and just so everyone know, it's our normal educational retreat, but we didn't want to call it the educational retreat this year because we have our educational report and we didn't want people to get it confused and think we we're trying to have a uh, private separate meeting on the education report. So it is now called our instructional report. And this is a, I'm sorry, instructional retreat. And this is the annual meeting that the commission has with the department to, um, better understand and learn what the department is working on and to talk about some of the things we will be doing for the upcoming year. And that will be reported out at our March meeting. The dates we were looking at are March 5th or March 10th. And since we've already had the new commissioner orientation, that will not be a part of this day. So we're looking at that time being anywhere from say uh, perhaps 9 a.m. until 12 or 1 p.m. in the afternoon. So it won't be a full day. Um, just a little over half a day. Has everyone had a chance to look at their calendars to see if March 10th, I'm sorry, March 5th or 10th would work for them? And if they have any conflicts? Commissioner Lara? Yes, I am not, I'm not available on March 10th. I have an all day uh, board retreat for another board. Okay, thank you. How is March 5th looking for the rest of the commission? I know I'm good for March 5th. Okay, Commissioner Alassane is good. Is there, any, is there anyone who has a conflict on March 5th? Okay, so it looks like March 5th it is. I don't know, do we need to actually do a formal vote on that, Dan, or can we just agree that March 5th will be the date and we'll work on the time within that time frame that I mentioned from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m.? I don't see any reason for a formal vote. Okay, very good. So we have selected March 5th as a date for our instructional retreat I will be working with Director White and Sylvia on the agenda for that. Of course, if there's anyone else who would like to be a part of that, I believe we can actually have a committee of up to three to work on that unless the commission wants to just defer that to the executive committee. Is there anyone who's not on the executive committee who would like to assist in the work going into the instructional retreat? Okay, then um, we are all set for that. That is it for my um, director's report. Oh, I'm sorry, just real quick. One thing that we will talk about in the retreat and I mentioned earlier is looking at some committees that the commission may want to have. We talked already about education equity and economic equity. So just know going in, those are committees that we will be hoping to form. And if there are any others, we can talk about those also. So. That is it for my director's report. Is there any new business that any commissioners have? Okay, no new business. Any commissioner closing comments or remarks from any commissioners? Okay, seeing none, then our final agenda item is adjournment of the meeting. Our next meeting will convene on Monday, March 22nd. Oh, Commissioner Combs, yes. Yeah, I wanted to comment that the um, agenda was well developed and comprehensive, was diverse, and it covered all of the uh, issues, in my view, uh, that we have been discussing for the past few years. And the speakers that uh, spoke were uh, very knowledgeable, uh, highly intelligent, and extraordinarily articulate. And um, outside of the issues that I will continue to raise, as you are well aware what that is, uh, this has been a very well packaged meeting in my view. Thank you. And thank you also commissioners for uh, your time. I know it is now 8.09, it's a three hour meeting. The first meeting of the year, I promise you, <laughs> they will not be this long anymore. But one thing I do hope that we will be able to continue on in our meeting is having outside people come in to speak to us, provide us with information because we get the department reports, we can read those, but I think it's an opportunity for us to learn and to provide a platform for those working in the area of civil rights to also have a broader audience. So that's what we're going to be looking to do for our meetings in 2021. So as I said, we are now moving for adjournment. Our next meeting is on Monday the 22nd at a date and time, I'm sorry, at a time and venue to be determined. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. 
Moved by Commissioner Combs, is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner El Hassan. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Motion carried and this meeting of the Mississippi Civil Rights Commission is adjourned at 8, 10 p.m. Thank you all very much. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone.